the December 14th, 2021, regular meeting of the Fairfield Board of Education is called to order. I'm joined tonight by Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Gerber, Superintendent Cummings, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Max Canelli, Mr. Peterson, and Ms. Kelly. I'm Christine Vitale, I'm the chair. Um, thank you all for your patience. I ask you all to please rise for the pledge and please remain standing. Um, this is the nine year anniversary of Sandy Hook. I'm sure um, everyone has kept those children and their families and their thoughts today. Um, so I thank you for just standing for that extra minute. Okay, I apologize for the late start. We'll move right on to our student reports. We'll start with our um, students from Fairfield Ludlow High School. Good evening, everybody. My name is Anna Kit Martins, and I'm a junior at Ludlow. As we approach the holiday season, the Ludlow Music Department has been very busy working on various performances and activities. Candlelight is Ludlow's annual holiday season concert, which will be returning to pre-COVID type performances in the auditorium, featuring 75 continuous minutes of music from Ludlow's highest levels of band, orchestra, and choir. Candlelight will be held next Tuesday, the 21st, and Ludlow seniors will be invited to watch it live during the school day before the holiday break, and it'll be live streamed to the rest of the school as well. Last week, Ludlow's choir department also performed at Radio City Musical for the Christmas Spectacular in front of the NYC Rockettes, 75 Ludlow students from Bel Canto, Chamber Choir, and Close Harmony performed for an audience of thousands. Regarding the FLHS orchestra and band programs, about 50 Ludlow students were invited to perform in the Connecticut Musical Association of Western Region uh, Music Festival at Greenwich High School on January 15th. And with those holiday season music updates over, I'd like to pass the mic to Reed. Good evening, my name is Reed Childers. I am your Senior Board of Ed representative from Fairfield Ludlow High School. The first thing I'd like to address is the No Place for Hate pledge that all Ludlow students signed during our advisory last week. So each student wrote their name down, committing to meeting the pledge and fostering an inclusive, caring school community. We also asked the parents of Ludlow students to sign the pledge as well. All these signatures will be displayed in the main hallway of our school and we will be hosting assemblies later this year to emphasize the importance of this community building exercise. So another important event happening soon, actually tomorrow, is that the parents of our sophomores are invited to have coffee at Ludlow. Um, Mr. Hattis will be sharing some interesting news and insights specific to the sophomore grade level and he will be answering any questions in an open forum. In addition, our culinary students will provide snacks and coffees for parents to enjoy. So if anyone's interested, it will take place tomorrow, December 15th from 9.30 to 10.30. The next topic is that our winter sports have begun. To kick off the season, Ludlow is hosting a huge wrestling tournament this weekend, and our girls and boys basketball teams will also be competing in away tournaments, I believe at Ward. Um, a few of the count Fairfield County schools are coming together for these tournaments, and it should be a great way to start our winter sports. Additionally, the FLHS Compassion Committee sponsored their eighth annual gift card and cash drive to benefit families in need in our Ludlow community. As of yesterday, December 13th, the committee had raised a total of $3,042 in gift cards. Lastly, I'd like to shout out two of our individual physical education teachers, Mrs. Kylie and Mrs. Marin, for recently presenting at a state conference. Mrs. Kylie presented on teaching self-defense and archery to high school students, and Mrs. Marin presented on yoga, mindfulness, and personal fitness. Both of these teachers aim to keep students safe and healthy through their support of these crucial courses, something that is greatly appreciated and respected. So thank you again if you're watching Mrs. Kylie and Mrs. Marin. That is all I have for you today. I'd like to wish everyone a happy holidays and give the mic over to the board students. Good evening, everyone. We hope you're all having a delightful December. Last week at Fairfield Ward High School, we had a presentation during homeroom set by Mr. Kavanaugh and Officer Chance Wilkie discussing the lockdown procedures set by the Fairfield Police Department. 
In addition, during an extended homeroom, the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors viewed a presentation that explained information on how to understand the PSAT score reports, instruction how to create a College Board account, and directions on how to link their College Board and Khan Academy accounts. Within the past few weeks, our winter sports have begun, and our ward student athletes are working and, working and practicing extremely hard and anticipating a winning season. We look forward to seeing their success as we head into the new year, and we wish them all the best of luck. And in addition, this week, Fairfield Ward High School opened its Triam clothing drive for the Bridgeport Rescue Mission to help families in need. From December 13 to December 22nd, we're encouraging all war students to donate new, new socks, gently used coats, linen, linen blankets, and etc. Donations will be collected at, in the front lobby. Moreover, next week, the students will have their activity period where they get the opportunity to attend some of the numerous clubs Fairfield Ward High School offers. And finally, our annual Carillon concert will be taking place next week with five overall performances, two during school hours for the incoming ninth graders, and three in the evening. Students involved in the music program have been rehearsing, and this week are partaking in two four-hour rehearsals to ensure an enjoyable experience for the audience. All in all, performers await to share their ast astonishing talents with different audiences. We hope everyone has a wonderful holiday break, and Lynn and I look forward to sharing more in the new year. Thank you for your time, and happy holidays. Thank you for your reports. Any questions for our students? No. Nope. Seeing none, um, wish you all a very happy holiday. And um, thank you again for your report. And you're welcome to stay, but you're also welcome to uh, you know, get on with your night someplace else if you like. Okay. okay. All right, we're moving on to public comment. Can I just have a show of hands of how many people are planning on giving public comment tonight? Okay. All right. Um, just we give three minutes for public comment per person. Um, public comment is given on agenda items only. We're going to start with um, our call in public comment first, being that they're always last. So, Mr. Asa, can you help with tech support there? Do we have our caller on the line? Marco, do we have Randy Cohen on the line? Uh, Randy is not on the line currently. She is in the audience, in the flesh, so we will hear from her here, so thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, that was the only call in uh, registered public comment. Thank you, Ms. Tracer, for that tech support. Um, we'll take it to the public. Any members of the public, you're welcome to come forward at this time. We also take public comment before voting items at the end of the meeting on agenda items. Everyone. It's nice to be back, although odd on the side of the table. Jennifer Leeper, 75 Sherman Court. I know my colleagues are deeply committed to pursuing policies that they believe are best for children. And what I've heard from the debate over this course is that they worry specific, significant historical events are missing from this new course. I offer two points for consideration. First, that is very difficult, perhaps impossible, to line up all historical events and prioritize what is more important and what should be excluded and for all of us to agree on each individual event. We could split hairs on prohibition versus the Tulsa race massacre or the industrial revolution versus the origins of chattel slavery and I don't doubt that this course is, le that this course is less than perfect but I also am not convinced that it is any less perfect than our current US history course. The breadth of events specifically covered in the course, also seem less essential when you consider the full year U.S. history our students complete in the eighth grade and all the other U.S. history our students learn throughout the education. Secondly, we've been provided an opportunity to shift the way we approach how we teach American history from what was previously perceived as a neutral detailing of chronological events into a recognition that all recounting of historical events happens through a lens. And now we have an opportunity to highlight the significance of the lens through which our historical events have been viewed. And in doing so, we're providing the students a unique and powerful opportunity to learn and think and question. I had the privilege to sit in on this course at Staples High School yesterday. 
and yesterday's discussion was on the rise of progressivism in the post-Reconstruction era and how workers began advocating for their rights and unionizing and how information was being shared in new ways from the publishing of The Jungle to the growth of journalism and exposing robber barons to photography showing child labor in the Lowell Mills. This led to a discussion about the role of government in protecting citizens. And the question that was posed to set up the conversation for the next lesson was, if all of this is happening in the early 1900s, why then didn't the civil rights movement emerge until the 1950s? Whose rights was progressivism focused on? Who were the unions fighting for? The discourse was so robust and engaging, and so many of the topics are debates we continue to engage in today. I was a part of this board when we debated and voted on the updated graduation requirements. We made a philosophical choice at that time to give students more choice and autonomy. I'm not sure why that choice ends here at this course. Whether or not the, board, the members of this board want this to be the case, and I feel confident that this is not your intent, your vote tonight says publicly that historical events prioritized and retold by predominantly white voices are more important and more valuable to our students to learn than what this course offers. Thank you, Ms. Leepar. That's time. Um, next. Mm -hmm. Just set your name and your um, address for the record. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ava Barahona. I live at 74 Cardinal Street in Fairfield. I am an eighth grader at Tomlinson Middle School, as well as the co-lead of the Beloved Community Club, a race and equity group made of students from all three middle schools. I'm here today in strong support of making the course of Black and Latino Studies fulfill a US history requirement. This is what it would mean to me as a student. I am half Latinx. My father is a high school Spanish teacher and the child of immigrants from El Salvador. I went to McKinley Elementary School, where I was fortunate to be exposed to a variety of cultures. I believe strongly that the course we are take, talking about should meet a history requirement. I want to learn about the history through this lens and also be able to use my electives to take courses in other areas I am interested in. While on the phone recently with my grandpa, he told me his immigration story. It brought tears to my eyes as I wished every student in FPS could hear these types of stories in the struggles that Latinx men and women have when immigrating to this country, as well as all the talents and contributions they made. On a family vacation a couple years ago, back a couple years back, my grandpa and grandma were rear-ended by a drunk driver. The lady came out of her car and spoke to my grandpa, who is a he who is who has a heavy Spanish accent. One of the things she said to him was, "Learn to speak English." If only this lady had a class like this in her high school, she would not have. She may have not said that to him. My grandpa worked so hard when he came here as a young man, and went to graduate from Columbia University. He is one of the top in his field in ultrasound medicine and travels around the world to give lectures and teach developing country, countries advice techniques. This story is only one of the many horrible things that he experienced. I have to think that if students in the country learned of the many contrib contributions and talents of Latin and black people throughout the history, it would help prevent the amount of unconscious bias and racism in the country. If, if offered, in a, an elect, elective only, we will likely not reach enough students to start changing belief patterns. So please, I hope you will take into account my voice in the, in the voice of the community that is clearly asking for this to be counted towards the history graduation requirement. I am really looking forward to starting high school next year and this is and sincerely to one of, to be the first to take this course and have it count towards my required credits. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Um, please, we, I just ask the audience, please, no applause. Um, thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Gracelyn, and my address is 240 Sunny Ridge Ave. Um, as a student, I'm going to be talking about Math Academy. As a student of the Math Academy, it is one of the best things that's ever happened to me in my elementary school years. I love Math Academy, and I've talked to all my classmates, and they all love this program, too. I want to give you some reasons why you should not stop Math Academy. 
Math Academy helps stimulate your brain. If the math is not challenging or the students already know the formula or feel like it's too easy, they might lose interest. All, kids in, all the kids in Math Academy say the same thing. I would, almost, I would always finish my math worksheet in one minute in previous classes. Or they say, I got an extra math packet, but I could still finish that easily too. Some kids can possibly lose focus in class because the curriculum was too easy for them. In Math Academy, the accelerated math is challenging enough to keep these students interested and focused. As some research shows, um, gifted students need faster paced lessons, deeper and more advanced content, and the opportunities to work with other kids like them, other students like them. They also require a different kind of interaction with the teacher. For teaching purposes, this is the most logical and efficient way to communicate with all the students at the same level. Great minds think alike. In Math Academy, the students are similar and have a feeling of feeling excluded. In other classes, the teacher would not call on you because you would always know the answers to the question. In Math Academy, we really understand each other and discuss the answers together. We are also not afraid to get the answers wrong. When we are surrounded by other like-minded students, we can bounce ideas and motivate one another. We don't get called names no matter how much we love math, science, or reading. So there is no bullying in Math Academy. This safe space will develop, will develop our cooperation, communication, and learning skills. We support each other and feel, and feel safe to be who we really are. The teachers are excellent and they make us feel like we belong in Math Academy. There has never been a bad day in fourth grade. Please do not close Math Academy for the future students. This experience will be benefit them forever. Thank you for listening. I'd like to hand you a petition that the fourth and fifth grade Math Academy signed. Um, the next person, come on. I am here to speak on behalf of Math Academy. I want to tell the story of the children that it serves as expressed to me by their parents. These kids show up at school Pardon either. me, ma'am. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you just state your name and address oh, for the so, record? I'm so, so sorry. And then you can start over. Oh, thank you. I apologize to everyone. Um, I'm Randy Cohen, uh, 200 Lloyd Drive. Thank you. Uh, I am here to speak on behalf of Math Academy. I want to tell the story of the children that it serves as expressed to me by their parents. These kids show up at school eager. They are excited to learn. The first two years of math education covers addition and subtraction within 20. What happens to these rapid learners once they master that material? Often within the first few weeks of class, they find to their dismay that they must spend hours, days, months, years in the classroom not learning, while others around them are learning. Their peers are learning, persistence, teamwork, and good study habits. These kids are told to sit down, be quiet, and stop trying. The emotional strain that this can cause in a six-year-old is hard to overstate. Parents watch their once enthusiastic child withdraw, seem defeated, become anxious, begin to resist attending school, cry at times when they get home. Some require counseling. Many have trouble making friends. Others can't stand the enforced idleness and begin acting out. They are labeled troublemaker and class clown. Parents feel helpless. Often they know this is because their child desperately needs more opportunities for school engagement. Many ask the teacher for help. Teachers are well-intentioned, but overwhelmed with other classroom responsibilities. So help, if it comes at all, is in the form of an occasional worksheet which does not begin to address the problem. Parents are generally told that extra help is only available to students who are behind the curve, not to students who are isolated on the other end. One student joked to his mom, 
It's okay, Mom. Maybe I'll learn something new next year. In Math Academy, Rapid Math learners are, for the first time in fourth grade, able to receive the same educational benefits that other students have been enjoying since kindergarten. They are able to be challenged in the classroom along with other learners their own age. The anxiety, restlessness, misery, and disconnection miraculously and entirely resolve once these students are allowed to connect with like-minded others and be challenged in the classroom. The class clown calms down and makes friends. The withdrawn child speaks up and becomes articulate. The joy we feel as parents in seeing our children chatting and laughing with multiple other children, it is hard to describe. As the board and educational I'm team sorry, have acknowledged. I'm sorry, that's, that's time is up. Thank you for your comment. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. If, if, you, if you want to submit the rest of it via email, you can email it to us. I'm sorry to cut you off. I invite the next person to come up. And if you are um, a minor, you don't have to give your address for the record. Um, hi, I'm Maya Henry. I live at 155 Fairmount Terrace. Um, hello, like I said, my name is Maya Henry, and I'm a student at Fairfield Ward High School. As my 19-year-old sister and alumni at Fairfield Ward and I had a discussion about the new course being voted on tonight, she said something that stayed with me. She said, I've learned more in one semester of college about different perspectives than I did in any of the U.S. history classes I took at Fairfield Ward High School. This stuck with me because one of the issues brought up was about how if kids were to take this class, they would miss out on important parts of U.S. history. I keep hearing board members say they're concerned we won't be prepared to enter the world, but the truth is that taking white U.S. history isn't preparing us for life outside of Fairfield. We need perspectives to, pers to succeed in our very diverse world. This class is too late for both me and my older sister, but please vote yes for voting this as a U.S. history requirement to give my younger sister and generations to follow a chance to learn about all of U.S. history. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Would anybody else like to come forward? And you don't need to give your address for the record. Uh, okay. Well, I have the same address as the last person anyway, so it <laughs> doesn't really matter. We're trying to like keep, you know, Hi, my name is Layla Henry. I'm here to talk about the Black, Latino, and Puerto Rican Studies course and the vote tonight. When you are voting, think about this. Every action can be categorized as racist or anti-racist. Anti-racism is where you're trying to break down racist systems. When you vote for the class tonight, an anti-racist action would be to vote for yes. Additionally, last time I spoke at a board meeting, I was cut off on my last sentence, so I wanted to leave you with my final thought which was, be the board that does what's right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry that I had to cut you off, but I'm trying to be really <laughs> consistent with the time. Just press the button. Hi, my name is Shannon Messina. I live at 285 Woodrow Avenue in Southport. According to the book entitled The Confidence Code for Girls by Claire Shipman, Katty Kay, and Jill Ellen Riley, girls' confidence levels drop by 30% during the ages of 8 and 18 years old. According to the New York Times article entitled The Confidence Game for Girls, Five Tips for Parents of Tween and Teen Girls, confidence in girls can be encouraged, nurtured, and even created during these turbulent years. The article goes on to say, that girls need to take risks and experience the failure that comes with it. How can girls do that in a classroom where the work is too easy? After the first month of school at the Math Academy, my daughter Michaela was worried that she wasn't doing well because she didn't already understand every single thing that was being taught like she had before. She was worried that she didn't belong in the Math Academy. We had a conversation with her teacher, Mrs. McCoy, and she told Michaela that if she already knew everything that was being taught, she wouldn't be learning, but she wasn't used to that. Mrs. McCoy wants the kids' brains to hurt a little bit. 
Now more than three months into the school year, Michaela is so excited to go to school every day. She has become more self-confident and eager to learn. She feels more comfortable in the classroom and she is not afraid to raise her hand and give answers. This is extremely important for all children, but especially girls. Michaela feels so strongly about the Math Academy now that she wrote a speech and insisted on reading it at your last Board of Ed meeting. She is willing to take risks and she feels confident enough in her ideas that if she is willing to share them confidently with a group of adult strangers, such as yourself, to keep the Math Academy alive. This is a huge achievement that would not have happened without Mrs. McCoy and the Math Academy. Mrs. McCoy is an amazing role model, especially for girls that love math. The Fairfield Public School System should be very proud of this program and should want to continue it for future students. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Hi, good evening. I'm here to speak about the Math Academy. Um, my daughter Talia, oh sorry, Melissa Baker, 127 Zo Strive. My daughter Talia is currently in the fourth grade Math Academy class. She struggled ever since first grade because she was ahead of most of the other children in her class. She was frustrated because differentiation could not be provided in the classroom or for homework. Her teachers, who are all wonderful, but only have so much time to spend with each student, told Talia to use Freckle or Prodigy, which are online math programs, in order to work at her level. Since these programs don't teach skills or concepts, she ended up being frustrated and lost a lot of self-confidence in academics as a result. She even told me last year that she hated math. When I asked about the possibility of enrichment with the math specialist, I was told that only children who are behind are eligible to receive assistance from the specialist. I have not pushed or complained because I definitely agree that the students who are not at the same benchmarks should absolutely receive assistance. Unfortunately, the children who are accelerated learners do get lost in the shuffle. This year is a completely different story for my daughter Talia. Because of Math Academy, she loves math and spends her spare time coming up with math problems for the family to solve. Her academic self-confidence has returned due to the interactive and supportive curriculum. She works with the other students in the class as opposed to being a secondary teacher to them. When the children in the fourth grade math academy heard that the program may be cut, they put together a document of why it should continue to be offered. My heart broke reading what they had written. I did not realize that so many children had been through the ringer academically and socially simply because their skills are beyond the grade level. Math Academy encourages the kids to embrace their love of learning rather than being ashamed by it. Isn't this the lesson we ultimately all want our children to learn? I understand that the school district does not have unlimited funds. However, I feel very strongly that Math Academy should continue to be offered in order to support the children that will otherwise get frustrated, lost, and ultimately not achieve their potential in our school system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tina Brown, 340 Mormons Lane. Um, I'm not familiar with everything that has gone on about the new history course, but I sort of ask a question. So I grew up in Fairfield. I grew up with parents who taught me, you know, never to be racist, never to be biased. We had homosexual in our family. Black people came to our house, everything like that. But then I went to Washington, D.C., and I worked there. And I found out I had no idea what racism was. I had no idea what bias was. I worked with a gentleman who was African American in a hotel, and he came down one night and he said, Tina, can you take this pillow up to the customer? And I went, why? He said, because she asked for one I hadn't touched. And if you don't teach the children what racism is, is and give them exact examples and have people who have experienced it tell them about it, you can say that our children are not racist till you're blue in the face. But I didn't know what it was. He taught me to watch for it. And I did. And in Washington, D.C., I'm sorry to say that racism is very much alive and well. 
but I never noticed it because it was never directed at me and I didn't know about it. I hadn't been instructed on it. Nobody explained it to me. They just told me, don't be racist, and I wasn't. I had friends of all different colors, all different races. LGBT didn't bother me, but I never knew what the other people were going through because I never experienced it. And I truly believe that this school system and every other school system needs to start educating our children by giving true examples, not by simply saying, don't be racist. Thank you. Anyone else like to give comment? Hi, my name is Riley Donald. I live on 360 Zost Drive, and I'm a junior at Ludlow High School, and I'm here in support of the African American, Black, and Lati Black, Latino, and Puerto Rican studies. While doing my homework for my class, Honors U.S. History, I noticed that minority races were mentioned in only two paragraphs after the, out of the entire Chapter 13 in the U.S. History textbook. And even then, these races were only mentioned with their interactions with white people. This cuts off the entire history that doesn't involve colonizer interaction. As students, we need this perspective to learn why our country is the way it is. This course has the ability to teach the way that African American and Latinx people have, have fallen victim to systemic racism. This course will lend a perspective that has been much needed for a long time. This course will act as the stepping stool for the future where there will be US history class that teaches the complete history. The history that teaches that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence while separating families and owning hundreds of slaves. The full history. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hello, David McInnes, 301 Sasco Hill Road, Fairfield. Um, uh, several people have been much more eloquent than I would, can be in uh, speaking in favor of the new U.S. history course fulfilling the junior history requirement. And I'll just share my um, background as a software developer because I think it, it is key in our decision here. So as a software developer, one of the important things is coming up with a schedule for any project. Um, you have a limited amount of time and you have certain features you'd like to include. But the first thing you must do is figure out what are your priorities, because that determines what features you're going to include. So I think our decision tonight is what is our priority as a school district? Is our priority to come up with alternative, to come up with alternative viewpoints and allow our students to view those viewpoints in their US history course or not? Once you've made that decision, then yes, there are things that must be included and there are things that cannot be included because you have a limited amount of time. And so you can all go through the list and say, well, this, this particular item, this event, uh, is not included in the new course. Uh, if you're gonna do that, in my job as a software engineer, if someone comes to me and, and wants their feature in the product, then the question is, well, what are you gonna throw out? So if you're going to come up with a list of what's not in this course that you would like to see in this course, Think about what you would remove, because no matter what you want, there's only 182 days in the school year. Okay? There's only so much time to work on a software project. And much as we'd like to imagine a longer time in the school year uh, and more time to work on our software project, that doesn't exist. That's a fantasy. So uh, I would urge us just to think, what is our goal? I see this as the first course in many that would give multiple lenses that our students could view history through in order to have a more diverse uh, school curriculum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else at this time? Hi, my name is Jennifer Elwood. I live at 46 Bibbins. Um, and I'm going to start by reading a statement from a community member who was not able to be here tonight, um, one of our Fair Fairfield Select women, Nancy Lefkowitz. To esteemed board members, to esteemed members of the Board of Education, when you cast your vote tonight regarding the African American, Black, Latino, and Puerto Rican studies course, I urge you to consider 
Is it with a commitment to advancing equity and improving the health and well-being for students of color through an equity and justice lens? How will your vote impact students and families of color? Is your vote representative wholly of the people who elected you and for whom you are committed to serving? I appreciate there is nuance here, frustrations around what the state should or should not be allowed to mandate, concerns around holes in this new course offering. However, if you're committed to advancing equity in our schools, then supporting this motion as presented is one way to express this commitment. Approving this course as eligible toward the US history graduation requirement in Fairfield Public Schools demonstrates that we are considering the expressed pain and frustration of Fairfield's BIPOC residents. It states empathetically that your history is our shared history and is valid and acceptable. Thank you for your consideration. Um, for my own words, if I have any minutes left, um, I just wanted to thank the board for taking the time to engage back and forth with me regarding concerns and opinions at passing this Black and Latino Studies course as it is presented before you for vote tonight. Um, as I've already stated, I urge you to vote yes to allow for this course to count as an option for the required US history credit needed to graduate Fairfield Public Schools. This course does fulfill the state social studies framework expectations for US history. It is endorsed by our district instructional and administrative leaders, many of our social studies teachers who are here tonight, many other teachers, community members, and students. Our state has agreed that there is no policy or expectation standing in the way of a yes vote. This course will include voices outside of black and Latino contributions. It is impossible to teach about minority cultures without also teaching about our majority culture. I appreciate there's a very difficult decision ahead of you tonight. Um, and I don't envy the position that we're all in. This is a difficult setting not to be able to talk openly back and forth about such an emotional topic. Um, so I just, I want you to hear that I appreciate you very much and um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? Good evening, Frank Sahagan, uh, 20 Chelsea Street, and retired eighth grade social studies teacher. Nice to see many of you again. And I want again, I want to first stop by thanking you for your service. It's really much appreciated. Um, seeing that the middle school block schedule is back in the spotlight, and as one, although now retired, who had voiced a number of concerns and questions two years ago, I'm grateful for this opportunity to raise some questions, not opinions, really. First, I noticed most of the specifics of the process work was pre-pandemic, with the most recent timeline pointing to working with IT and a consultant. Question I have is, was there any teacher participation in developing this new, new plan? And what about teacher buy-in? Is it there? Previously, we knew there were a number of concerns on the part of teachers and wonder if this proposal addresses them. If so, perhaps and hopefully these concerns will be reiterated tonight and how it does so. Uh, I also wonder whether this proposal has created any new questions or concerns on the part of the teachers, and if so, what are they? And as I've said previously before this body, I think the buy-in of stakeholders is critical whenever making changes of this magnitude. Addressing intervention and enrichment was one of the previous concerns, and it now looks like as though it will be addressed in the win component of the teacher's schedule within a block. My, my being pressured for time, I hope you explore this component in more detail with the administrators. It would seem to me, if I were still in the classroom, that the planning process for this sporadic component would present considerable challenges of scope and sequence within the curriculum. Leading to the amount of time for teacher planning, planning has been combined with meetings on the teacher calendar. How much planning time will there be for teachers over the course of a week, and how does it compare to what they currently have? And will there be any contractual conflicts? The proposal calls for an increase of 4.6 FTE. During a time when the district is already having difficult in filling staff, is this a good time to be going down this path? And along with that, do we have any contingencies if we lose teachers, as there's distinct possibility that some will not welcome this change and not have much difficulty finding a job elsewhere? I think it's fair to say that what's being proposed will require a dramatic change in the planning and delivery process of instruction and create even more work on a staff that is already feeling taxed. 
Although I no longer have any skin in the game personally, I do have concerns for my former colleagues and students and hope we cross every T and dot all the I's before implementing such significant change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sahagian, and it's nice to see you again. Anyone else? Um, hi, my name is Ahadi Guitari, and I am a student of Math Academy. I am here to put a face to the description you have heard tonight of children who struggle to fit in until they join Math Academy. I know firsthand how it feels. My parents were called many times to school in second and third grade because I was getting in trouble a lot. Now I am challenged daily and enjoy school. Please do not deny other students like me this amazing opportunity to not only excel, but to fit in. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope. Hi, my name is Colleen Souza. I live at 271 Oakwood Drive. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight, so I apologize if this is not as articulate as I would like it to be. I've been a social studies educator in Fairfield for 17 years. I've had some of your children in my classroom. I love my work in Fairfield. I am proud of our schools, but it is no secret that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to our plan for DEI. I do feel like we are presented with a unique opportunity here to engage in this work by qualifying this new course for U.S. History. We have parsed a lot of questions about content and what is the most important things for students to learn in a US history course. And one of the things that I think is really important is to think about what we want our students to get out of the school system here. And I have to say that when students leave my classroom, I don't really care so much if they know every single piece of content that I've taught them. I care if they felt valued, if they felt seen, if they learned to read critically, write critically, ask the right questions. And I wanna anchor this in reminding all of us what the Fairfield Public Schools vision of a graduate is, because that has nothing to do with content. Some pieces of our vision of a graduate, I just pulled up on our website. Fairfield Public School students will perform at high levels in regards to social and civic expectations, develop into responsible citizens who exhibit ethical behavior, acknowledge, explore, and value the importance of diversity, develop a healthy personal identity and self-reliance, exhibit inquisitive attitude, open mind, and curiosity, acquire an understanding and appreciation of other cultures, understand international issues, and demonstrate the skills needed to participate in a global society. None of that has anything to do with whether or not they learn prohibition or any other of the many con content pieces that have been mentioned through this debate. Just to close, there is a moment that haunts me as an educator. In one of the many difficult conversations that we had in my classroom in response to some of the racist incidents that have occurred that we have had to respond to as a school system, one of my students of color looked at me and said, Mrs. Souza, I appreciate you, I value that you're having this conversation with us, but you don't know what it's like to be me. And no one in this school knows what it's like to be me. There are no teachers that I can identify with. There are no courses for me. And I think about that a lot. And I think of how her high school experience would have been different had this been a course offering. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you for everyone who gave comment. Just again, you can give comment at the end of the meeting and prior to any votes. We are moving on to presentations. Presentation and first reading of the math K through 12 curriculum. Mr. Cummings? Um, just really briefly, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Rasmus and Mr. Wakeman come on up. I want to thank them in advance, the teachers. Um, numerous teachers that have been working with them for quite some time. This was a, a effort um, of consistency and persistence, uh, given all that they've also had to deal with, that all both their administrators and teachers have had to deal with um, over the course of the past almost two years now. So I just want to thank them in advance for all the work they've put in and for all the staff hours that they represent. So thank you, gentlemen.
I'd like to welcome everybody to our um, presentation here tonight related to the, uh, the kind of the outline and the kind of the work that went, that went through to go through a uh, one of the first for a ultimately a one, one of the what they call the big four related to um, uh, uh, a full K-12, pre, actually pre-K-12 mathematics curriculum review. And uh, before I get started, I, I'm Dr. Rasmussen. I am the, uh, the uh, the program director for secondary math and student achievement. Uh, to my left, I'll let Walter kind of introduce himself. Yes, Walter Wakeman, a program director for elementary mathematics, science, and enrichment. And also, as, as, as we kind of, uh, I go back to one of my, my former colleagues where they talk about, we have to really understand curriculum, we really understand that the, direct, the definition of curriculum is, ultimately we want to talk about the curriculum in terms of uh, the, uh, what we want students to know and do by the end of the course. And also along this, this review uh, were, was a number of different things. And one of the things that we'll be kind of uh, presenting you tonight was also the, the, the tools that go along the way that uh, support the teacher to the implementation of the curriculum in terms of the instructional resources. So when we get into this presentation tonight, we'll be uh, kind, of, kind of outlining the various things that related to that in terms of the curriculum, but also the, the, the review and the update and a proposal for additional courses, especially at the high school. All right, uh, again, thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to share this uh, update with you on the, and the proposed documents that are uh, accompanying this. We are going to focus uh, tonight briefly on the process that we used to review the curriculum um, uh, and the resources. We'll share with you some of the issues and, uh, that we found as well as uh, the supporting resources. Um, we will talk about the, some of the proposed changes, and then we'll also speak to the budgetary impl implications for the resources by the time we get to the end of this. One of the things that, uh, that can always should be one of the drivers is ultimately is what, what do students need? Um, and this actually came from the World Economic Forum in terms of the top 10 skills that students need in 2025. And if you actually look at these, we have many things here that actually relate to the things that we really value as a district in terms of analytical thinking and innovation, complex problem solving, critical thinking and creativity, and also getting down to resilience and, all, and continued into reasoning and problem solving and ideation. And ultimately is, I mean, this was developed a number of years ago, again, as, as was stated prior uh, uh, in public comment related to our vision of the graduate in terms of these six, six attributes that we really value as a district in terms of what we want ultimately our students to be leaving our district in terms of to be really prepared for uh, in terms of being college and career ready in terms of being uh, innovators or uh, being uh, creative effective communicators collaborators critical thinkers responsible fitters and goal directed resilient thinkers and this is the lens that we looked at and ultimately as what what do we affect in terms of what we want to do in terms of a math program So I'm going to speak for a moment about the math practice standards. It's going to come up at a couple of points in our presentation this evening. The math practice standards are similar to other standards. In other words, at the end of grade three, we expect all kids to multiply and divide with proficiency. A math practice standard is another expectation that we expect kids to be able to know and to be able to do at the end of any grade level. And that is, for example, making sense of problems and persevering and solving them. These are student standards. These are what we expect the students to do. Reason abstract, uh, abstractly and quantitatively. Construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. Model with mathematics, using appropriate tools strategically, attending to precision, making use of structure and expressing regularity in, our, um, in repeated re reasoning. Okay, So these are not just learning goals, but they're also way kids learn mathematics. And so they're very important. Um, they're also, uh, they're integrally involved in the learning process, but this is also the foundation to building a mathematics community, engaging kids in um, problem solving together, talking to each other, communicating. Um, and this also speaks to a larger context that we were just speaking about uh, that's come up earlier, and that's around equity, equity of access. We want all kids to make sense of problems and to persevere. We want all kids to engage in productive struggle, which these practices lend themselves to. So these are very important um, standards that we also expect kids to engage in uh, in the learning process. And also adding on to that, these, in, in terms of the, the, the lens of the, um, the vision of the graduate, these are the things that are made that specifically align to the vision of the graduate that ultimately is what students should, should be doing in the classroom uh, in terms of specifically for mathematics. 
This also comes from terms of the view of M NCTM. Um, ultimately, this comes out of a, what they call the NCTM's catalyzing change um, resources that came out in the last couple of years. So for example, there's a number of different eight, eight practices what they believe are ultimately uh, uh, guide to equitable math pract instructional practices in the classroom. I'm not gonna go over all, all of them, but ultimately some of, the, some of them, one of the important ones all, is really getting at the tasks that students get ultimately that promote uh, uh, reasoning and problem solving. So actually finding those tasks and actually being able to implement those and, and students are able to access and when they get into those tasks. Similar to also getting into is then from those tasks, ultimately facilitate a, a ma effective math discourse, which gets at those math practice standards that we said in the earlier slide. And also kind of getting at in terms of, uh, in terms of effective math instruction is, is supporting that productive struggle in, in math. That sometimes you learn best when you actually are at that time where you're, you're, you're learning through that productive struggle. And each one of these in terms of, the, the, I've, I've highlighted three here are all important in terms of what we, in terms of providing, creating that, uh, that culture in the math classroom that actually gets at uh, and, uh, ultimately, and then goes back to the math practices, but then also goes back to the, um, uh, the vision of the graduate as these are the types of things that we are looking for in the classroom. Just one other comment on the productive struggle, uh, that uh, last bullet point there, or that last area there was, um, that pertains to all students. So regardless of how a student enters into a particular problem and or a particular classroom, we expect productive struggle for all kids. So uh, just to give you a little background on our process, we started in September of 2019 by bringing together a steering committee. Uh, the initial meeting was sort of setting up the goals and the aims of the review process and taking a look at the district data um, uh, much of that data has been shared with you since September of 2019. Uh, and the committee has worked um, through November. Uh, we did a brief update and a presentation on initial findings and some of that data. Um, in February, uh, we had subcommittees um, doing a little bit more probing behind what are some of the causal factors behind these da the, the data that we were looking at. Uh, we did end up taking a brief hiatus uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and it was interesting because we stopped in March and we were able to resume again in March. Um, the steering committee um, brought to, uh, pulled together their findings and made some uh, conclusions and, and some recommendations. Uh, this work had also continued through uh, the course of the summer. So um, I'm beginning to forget which summer. I think I lost a year there somewhere, but uh, we did bring teachers in. Um, and then since May through uh, November, we have at the elementary level been reviewing additional resources. Um, and not for adoption, but in support of uh, the challenging our students and also revision of units uh, for greater emphasis on some of the standards um, that could use greater emphasis uh, as we've, uh, at, at, that were results of, of some of the areas that we could focus on in our, our um, assessment results. Sorry, that was not very articulate, but I hope you understood what I just said. And then finally, the middle school and high school resource review uh, and selection process also, also took place, which brings us to this evening and the presentation to you. <clears throat> At the elementary level, uh, some of the uh, issues that we found, there is a greater emphasis needed on the mathematical practices, uh, the vision of a graduate and academic expectations. Um, that's uh, in part uh, much of what we presented to you in the very beginning of this presentation. Um, we also found that the instructional resources uh, are meeting the expectations. However, that there is an opportunity for us to improve uh, extension or challenge materials um, uh, that to accompany the resource, resources that we currently use, and that the trends in pre-K-5 levels reveal a greater need for inst uh, a greater in instructional emphasis on certain standards um, uh, that are, sh uh, again, showing up in our data as an area of weakness. Similar to in secondary, again, is our continued practice to uh, emphasize uh, improvement in terms of, our, again, the math practices that were stated earlier in the presentation, vision the graduate, and also the academic expectations. Is that, again, that is our continued work uh, related to the, uh, the graduation requirement. And also there's, uh, in terms of also looking to, um, you will see here in a second here, looking at our instructional resources, we're not meeting our expectations. Um, and, and ultimately, and then also some of the recommendations were also coming out in terms of we, needing more elective option after high school to really kind of meet the needs of all our students in terms of their, really their, their interests of where they were wanting to go later down the line. 
And more specifically, is uh, th this is uh, uh, a screenshot um, uh, from a website called Ed Reports. Ed Reports is a um, is a nonprofit institution that it kind of really looks at, and, and really their goal is to provide the evaluate the, the resources, the instructional resources that that are out there um, in various subject areas, um, and ultimately with the goal to to provide teachers the best instructional resources. So if, if this is a screenshot of our current middle school resource. Cur currently look at this, uh, ultimately one, when they talk about focus and coherence on the left, that is concerned to the alignment to the standards. So ultimately is, is, is our resources were not meeting our needs for, uh, for, to support all our students in the classroom um, in grades six, seven, and eight. And also, again, not meeting the needs in terms of those rigor and mathematical practices that we kind of, that we were looking for and also looking to improve. And ultimately, our middle school resources were, were not meeting our expectations. And ultimately, that was one of the, the issues that we were looking to uh, address. Similar to high school, in terms of, uh, in terms of our Pearson resource uh, that we have and are currently in our Algebra 1 and Geometry. Similarly, again, not meeting our expectations uh, in terms of the focus and coherence to the standards and also for or, uh, focus and coherence to the uh, mathematical practice standards. So ultimately is we are looking now to, to improve upon these instructional resources. Let me try this again. Some of the proposed changes at the elementary level, uh, pre-K through five curricula will remain fairly consistent. There'll be minor changes in the sequencing. Uh, and there has been some work and effort into revising some of the language for clarity. Uh, but aligning to uh, the Common Core standards, we're uh, maintaining pretty much consistency. Uh, with our previous version. Um, the revision of the pre-kindergarten through grade five uh, units um, will place greater emphasis on some of those in stand, uh, some of the standards, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, as well as enrichment. Um, we uh, propose to continue to maintain our current resources, the K-5 Bridges, um, second edition, and the Fairfield resources that we uh, also have. And, um, but with the addition of the pre-kindergarten um, Bridges second edition, which was not available at the time we purchased the K-5 version. That has come out since the last adoption. Um, we'd like to extend those materials right on down into the pre-kindergarten uh, to have greater consistency and implementation uh, at that level. Um, also additional supplemental K-5 resources will be added to provide enrichment opportunities and really a focus on professional development uh, to address the needs around equity and the vision of a graduate. So those are primary focus areas for the elementary level. Similar at the, uh, at the middle school, again, we'll, we will be keeping our, 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 our same course sequence in terms of our math six, math seven, math eight, uh, pre, technically pre-algebra eight, and also the accelerated sequence at the, at the middle school in terms of our transition to pre-algebra and our pre-algebra seven, and then leading into a, a full rigorous algebra one um, at the eighth grade. Um, so, but we will be having some sequencing in terms of some of the units, and especially as the, one of the recommendations is that we will uh, adopting what we call the, our, our, the Ed Gems instructional resource to support the implementation of the curriculum. And, and, and again, to kind of what, what, what this resource will help us and actually will help us accomplish was also be able to, again, continue the focus on professional development. But around the, the equity work, and especially we talking about when we talk about those equitable instructional practices, those are the types of things that to to support all our learners, and the version of the graduate. So ultimately, is having the, the the resource to provide the professional development to ultimately get at the equity and the vision of the graduate, and that's all with the Ed Gems resource map. So ultimately. I'm, Walter, That's all right. This is uh, the review, the same Ed Reports review um, of our the Bridges resource that we currently are using. Again, as you can see, it comes out fairly strong in meeting the expectations. Um, and uh, it's the um, findings of the committee that is showing us that we need to have some greater emphasis on some of the, the uh, challenge resources, which is what we're looking to um, support. Sim similar to at the middle school is this, the recommendation go to Ed, uh, Ed, to, uh, Ed Gems really kind of supports the one now having a resource that is more focused coherent in terms of the standards and also the mathematical practices. So again, providing the, the, the middle school teachers uh, a resource that's really supports the kind of getting out of what, we, what we're looking for to, su to support the students uh, to the uh, division of the graduate and the math practice standards.
In terms of the high school, um, we, we are expecting uh, uh, more changes at the high school to ultimately uh, meet the needs of, of our students. Uh, ultimately, we, we will uh, update our Algebra 1 Geometry, Algebra 2 um, Pre-College Curricula to kind of have better content alignment. We are not recommending any changes to our Calculus AP Curricula, which comes from College Board, uh, our prob probability and statistics course, our Financial Algebra, and Multivariable co uh, Calculus. We are recommending to remove the trigonometry and math modeling courses. I would like to, uh, I'll get into that when I show how um, our sequence of courses, um, a diagram here in a little bit. As one, one of the recommendations is, is to add more applied mathematics elective courses. Um, we, uh, we are recommending three courses, modern mathematics, transition to college math, and advanced mathematical decision making. I will actually get further into these specific courses in more detail um, shortly. And with the adopt and with the with the realignment in terms of the uh, the resources, uh, the recommendation is to um, uh, uh, adopt the illustrative mathematics for the algebra one, geometry, algebra two as an instructional resource. Um, also, uh, look to uh, update our pre-calculus instructional resources, and but also then add in the uh, the instructional resources for those three added elective courses: the modern mathematics, transition to college math, and advanced mathematical decision making. More specifically, at why illustrative mathematics? Again, it is a, is a resource that is highly supported in terms of the evaluation, not only from our own teachers, but also the teachers, uh, the, uh, the ed reports, in terms of its alignment to the standards, the, the state standards, and the mathematical practices. So ultimately, again, providing the, to, the teachers with the tools needed to get at the math practice standards and ultimately the vision of the graduate. Similarly, ultimately, this, this will be um, the sequence of math courses at the high school. Again, continuing with our, our Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2 sequence, but really kind of expanding on um, the, 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 what I call the, uh, our elective offerings in terms of the applied math to provide students more options related to their area of interest and need. The two courses that we're recommending removing were really down here in the more of the calculus route in terms of the trigonometry, and also the math modeling, because the math modeling was a really a function-based uh, uh, kind of evaluation using data. Ultimately, so we will ultimately want to, to provide more options in terms of the applied math is, and, and for, for students that are really wanting to go down for those of the courses that meet their needs, what, uh, say, and their, their, their um, college needs, or even career needs. More specifically, the modern math course. This really is a, an application-based math course for students looking to go into the liberal arts and political science fields. They'll be getting into a number of different topics, looking at elections, getting at uh, um, a ranked choice elections, the, ma the math behind elections. Additionally, going into management science, where they ultimately talk getting into what they call paths and networks, getting into uh, Euler paths, uh, Hamilton networks, uh, uh, circuits, et cetera, ultimately getting at the, which will get to scheduling. How do you find the most efficient schedule based off a number of options? So that is really kind of getting into that management science, which can be very useful for students, not just, um, just for ultimately when they leave our system. And, it's, uh, and where it comes from, the, the recommended resource that goes with it would be the modern math textbook by Tannenbaum. Similar to that is, uh, would be the recommendation is to add in what they call the transition to college math or TCM. This course is, is really for, to support students who may or not have read, uh, met those college readiness expectations, possibly as identified through the, uh, the PSAT or the SAT. This again is a course that's really built actually from the University of Texas Dana Center, which is, a, which is an institution that really does supports the effective uh, um, development and also resources for uh, effective teaching of mathematics. Um, and in this course, it's actually developed in terms of it has emotional, uh, social emotional standards already built in. So this course can really help meet the needs of our students that may need some more supports before going off to college. And uh, then this, uh, and, the, and, and the resource that goes along with this actually is on the platform of, of Agile Mind. So again, it, it, having those resources that the teachers then can help support the students to, to get at the need for, for their needs moving forward. The last kind of elective that we're also proposing is what we call it is advanced mathematical decision making. 
this is really is an applied math course to provide students an opportunity to use the mathematics to make effective decisions. But ultimately, isn't that our goal? We want to, we, we want to use the mathematics, which is the study of logic, to make effective decisions. So getting at statistical studies, designing, uh, modeling data, financial decisions, ultimately, ultimately, how can we use math effectively to, uh, to uh, when, when we leave our, our, our system here in Fairfield. And again, this, the, the resources are developed through the University of Texas Dana Center um, to, uh, for the teachers to implement the curriculum. So from a budgetary standpoint, uh, we are not proposing the purchase of a new resource um, and feel that we can um, utilize the current resources that we have to help address some of the needs uh, that we have been finding in our um, both in the curriculum and in the in the um, implementation of the curriculum, um, there are, uh, are, is some funding to support the additional challenge um, challenge and also the uh, pre-K uh, resources that we're moving forward with. Um, uh, there is some work that has been done, but more work that needs to be done in, uh, to make sure that we are aligning all of our units with the revisions and the updates in our current curriculum documents, um, and also to take a look at the, the challenge component of that. And then um, also the professional uh, support for teachers, the professional learning for teachers, um, which is an ongoing thing. This is more of a, a long-term uh, process um, to continually uh, address um, building teacher capacity as we continue to move forward. At the secondary level, the, the, the investment is, uh, is, is a little larger. Um, so, uh, ultimately, is because we're replacing so many resources, there, there, there does come with um, uh, a cost related to that. It ultimately, is uh, ed gems. And ultimately, these, this is for a six-year license. So this is six years worth uh, 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 of, the, of the resources and online licenses that come with uh, the uh, teacher access and student access for this resource. So at the middle school, the, the ultimate cost are around $190,000. For the Algebra 1, Geometry Algebra 2, in terms again, a six-year license related to that uh, uh, to support the implementation of the, uh, those uh, updated curricula. Um, and also, uh, again, a six-year license for the Blitzer Precalculus, uh, a little over $100,000. And, uh, and additional resources for the modern math course, transition to college math, and advanced math um, to support uh, the uh, purchasing of those resources. And, and, and similar to what Walter kind of uh, re referenced, uh, to me the most important thing will also be the, the investment in our teachers, on, and um, especially in the, the professional development, to ultimately how to support the implementation of the curriculum and also learning about the, uh, the new resources and the development of implementation guides, um, uh, assessments that go along the way upon approval. And as we begin to wrap up here, there's uh, one thing that I, we really want to kind of circle back here. Uh, the reason why the, the, de the decisions that were made along the way in terms of the recommendation of the resources, a number of different things, again, was really our, our guidepost, which is here the vision of the graduate. The resources and the curriculum that we uh, that we are proposing are, are meant to get at this. Uh, going back to those top ten skills that students need for 2025 when they leave our, our public school system, in terms of being innovators, communicators, collaborators, critical thinking, responsible thinking, and goal-directed resilient learners. So th this is really uh, for our proposal as we uh, as we present to you um, to to ultimately how do we provide our teachers and the ultimate and the students the resources needed to actually get at this. And as we close, I mean, and I showed you, this is really a collaborative process. There was a number of teachers that were involved along the way, and Walter and I could not have got, uh, done what we were able to complete through these two years um, uh, to, from um, this steering committee, summer work, um, we, like we, we end up, met, for the secondary level, we're meeting with um, a college prof professors from UConn to kind of really talk about how to reimagine, especially at the high school level, to how to add more uh, additional uh, courses of interest for students of, uh, of, of uh, going into different areas. And ultimately then to teachers on the search committees for these resources. Uh, th th their feedback has been invaluable. Um, along the way, and I can't thank them. Every single one of them, um, the blue, the, the teachers that are labeled in blue, those are the secondary teachers 
six through 12, and the, the students that are in the green, I mean, the teachers in the green, or those are the um, elementary and pre-K teachers. So again, I cannot thank them all enough to uh, what we were able to accomplish, and especially what we were also also going through, not only just on the curriculum review, but also um, to, uh, to continue to support uh, effective instruction in the classroom. So again, I, as, I, as I wrap up, I, I say thank you to every single one of them. All right, I'd also like to extend my thanks. There uh, may even be some names, not actually, I know there are uh, names on this list because I did reach out across the district um, to invite voices from all the teachers. Um, so I appreciate all the, the feedback and input from teachers as well as the administrators who not only supported us in our work, but also supported their release and being able to support our work in the process. So again, many hands, but a great appreciation for um, the, being able to participate in this process and get all these voices in. Mrs. Gerber, you had a question? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and thank you to all the staff who worked on this. I saw a lot of familiar faces for over all the years when my kids were in the district. So um, uh, I'm sure that the work that they all did was really exemplary. Um, I just have one question. Obviously, the, um, the cost page is um, you know a little daunting. Um, I totaled everything up. and. Everything on this page is about $755,000, and obviously the huge bulk of that is uh, materials. So um, one question I have, um, how long have we had the materials that we're currently using, or how long have we been using them for? Well, specifically the high school, I mean, middle school, I, we, I believe we adopted the, uh, the uh, big ideas in 2013, so we've had them for about nine years. So, I mean, w there is a need to update them, not only because, I mean, they're nine years old, but also, and you, as you saw, in terms of the alignment to what we need to teach um, within our curriculum. And then what about the, uh, the high school? Tech? High school is about the, the Pearson Al and Algebra 1 geometry was exactly the same. We, have, we adopted all those in the same year. Yeah, I, I have memories of yes. going over to central yeah. office and looking at all these terrifying books because math was never my strong suit. But, um, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, oh, and I'm sorry, one other question. Um, uh, how many students have been taking the courses that you're recommending to be discontinued? In terms of the math modeling and trig, I believe there's one section at each high school. I mean, there, there one two, section of each there, class there, at each high school, so two, four classes. There, there are two semesters. I mean, each course, the trig and the math modeling is a semester each. And the, usually they start with math modeling in the fall. And then they take, most of the students take trig in the second semester. So it's, it's the same kind of group of students. There is once, pretty much one group of students at each, there's, so one section of math modeling and one section of trig at each high school. Okay, and so you believe that then the, the new courses that are being offered will be able to fill the need for those students and perhaps draw additional students in, yeah. but that no one's going to be kind of left without well, and especially having something. Because we've been so heavily focused on what I call the calculus route. There's a lot of students going into the pre-calculus, and I always ask them, what do you want to do uh, in terms of when you go to college or career? And that should be the main driver of what the math courses that you would like to take. That's where we talk about the, the calculus route. If you want to become an engineer or go into the natural sciences, well, that's the math course that you would need. But if you're looking to go into the social sciences, the statistics courses are very relevant, but if you're if you're not in those two areas, then we were very light in those applied math courses, and that's why the recommendation is to add. So, so I think you may you're going to see probably some students maybe go like, hey, I I think these math courses were, were going to really interest me in terms of what I want to accomplish down the line. Thank you, Ms. Jacobson. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Is this on? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, it doesn't have a page, number, but I'm on the what are the proposed changes page um, where it says elementary and middle on just the bullet point that says additional supplemental K-5 resources will be added to provide enrichment opportunities. Can you just um, provide a little more color on what you're thinking about what those resources um, are or what you mean by enrichment opportunities? 
Uh, so um, I had shared some of this information at our last board meeting, but I'll go through some of those again. Um, the, uh, one of the proposed changes is a um, challenge math group that would ha uh, occur once in a, a six-day cycle for the fourth and fifth grade students. Um, and um, there, uh, there are some costs associated with that just to purchase some materials. Um, there are, we're looking at some additional resources to embed within our unit so that every single unit has some extension resources that are not um, uh, additional units, but can support small group instruction within the current con uh, structure of the units that, that teachers are teaching and make those available. And then also um, we're looking at um, embedding some other more open-ended problem solving resources in uh, units where they are appropriate and will fit um, that uh, will either be directly implemented into the units written into our, our current sequence of units and or um, will be able to be available for as parallel work for teachers to provide. For example, it might be a, a five or 10 day sequence of things that kids could engage in in terms of math problem solving. Okay, thank you for answering that. Um, for secondary, just um, algebra one, eighth grade algebra to nine. Those courses, and just if you could speak to this now, because we have the middle school to high school credit issue, um, those two courses will be the same so that the, okay, I see you nodding, go ahead. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, when you say for high school, again, algebra one, geometry, algebra two, and pre-cal curricula for better content alignment, can you just provide a little bit more color about what you mean about that? I mean, ultimately, I think it goes to like, is really having the resource to kind of help guide us to what is the expectation of the standards at each one of those courses. Because sometimes our, under our current resources, there, there may not to be a, what, what I call the correct interpretation of what, what, to what depth do I need to teach. So ultimately is having those resources to help guide us to, because as you see to the, um, the evaluation from Ed Report is, uh, those resources provide get the guidance to what, to what level to teach. So that helps guide us to the, what needs to go in Algebra 1, Geometry Algebra 2, but also pre-calculus. So having those resources provided us the kind of like the, the concrete example of what we need to teach to what depth, and also an alignment to understanding of what are the expectations of the SAT also. So having also those kind of uh, looking at those from a larger level can better understand of what is being taught in each course. Okay, I understand better what you meant by that. I'm um, just looking at the graph page. Um, algebra one, geometry, algebra two. Is this to suggest that this would be a base that all students we would hope or expect to take at least those three, and then from there you diverge and go to where you may want to go? Is it my understanding yes, this most correct? Students, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the new high school elective courses. I don't, and I'm sure this will come, we don't have course descriptions, so I think that will help kind of, will we have those by the next time or no? Those are actually in the curriculum documents and the, and the big huge document that has all the links that we the, Okay, that, okay. Um, and are those being offered at just one level? Are these college, okay, go ahead. Uh, just straight, uh, single course elective, it's meant to be, I mean, not to be a leveled course, because ultimately it's an application-based course that it really kind of gets at, like the thing, we don't have a leveled financial algebra. I mean, it's ultimately, it's the same expectation and standards for all students related to what is their need. Um, similar to the, the, the transition in college math, that course was developed specifically from, right. uh, by, by the University of Texas for those students that need that support. So those are all college prep electives then? Okay, okay thank you. Um, and just from the basic description that is in this, um, the advanced mathematical decision making seem to be pretty statistical based, and I just, if you have a clarification on how that might differ from the statistics route, because it seems statistic heavy, so yeah. if there's a simple answer to that. <laughs> Probably, I mean, ultimately, is uh, we put it in applied math because it's so kind of hands-on what the students are gonna be doing. I mean, you could actually put it over into the statistical route because of this in nature. But again, it's more because in terms of what the, the applied math of being able to use math to solve problems. That's why we kept it up in that area. Mr. Peterson. Hi, thank you. Um, so FTE impact, do you expect this to be FTE neutral? I mean, you're, you're removing two electives and adding three electives. In terms of FTE, I would look at it because if 
I mean, those stu the, stu the students will go somewhere. The, 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 the number of students that are taking the math, math courses is, is, is finite. Um, it, it, so looking at the, with the number of requests, if students are then pulled to say a pre-calc or the statistics to go to the other road, that will take care of it in terms of the FTE. So ultimately is looking at how you, also we develop FTE based off of the number of requests. Um, so ultimately the, the, the students that are uh, kind of requesting the courses should be some, if they may have some new uh, kind of uh, shifts between courses, but I, I wouldn't, right now we're not anticipating any changes related to these new courses. Oh, okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Cummings had something to add to that. Yes, I was just going to concur with uh, Dr. Rasmussen that we would expect a redistribution of courses and that FTE impact should be neutral. All right, that's that's fine. Um, I guess and I, uh, somewhat related to that, you, you said earlier um, that the applied math track previously had seen light enrollment. You're, you're kind of hoping, I imagine, by offering a more diverse stable of options that you will attract more people to this, to this track. Yes. yes. And, that, and that's actually one of the big pushes from the state also. Um, I, I was just asked to present this at a conference last week because um, there's really interest in not only providing the courses that are more calculus root based or statistic based, but more that are more applied that, that meets the needs that get at those 10 skills that, that the students need when they leave our schools uh, around problem solving um, uh, 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 related to all uh, for that go right at our vision of the graduate. So. We want to provide more of an option for students that can be more applied and hands-on or focus on pro developing sure. the problem solving. No, that, that makes sense to me. Um, the only other thing that I'd, I'd mention um, relative to the, 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 the prior textbooks, the, the Bridges textbook was published in 2016. The EdGems math, wait, I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, these, I, I was surprised to see these texts, the, uh, the big ideas math, Looks like it was published. This edition was published in 2015. That is, that's being evaluated here. Um, the the other the high school one has uh, a published date of 2016. Yeah. So do the, we have do we have the prior editions of these, or do we have the most recent editions of we these? We have and the prior edition to the. I believe they were like a 2012 edition. All so right. they're even before that. So, but so those are the ones that have the the poor. Yeah. Poor ratings. They are exactly the same thing. They they just kind of right. change a few things and adopt, uh, uh, change the copyright date and 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 then and publish and keep on publishing on. No, I mean I guess you know in some ways like these aren't fifty year old texts. Like have the, the standards have changed enough that you you find these books effectively well, obsolete? Well, for well the yeah, especially because we were just getting into the new standards when we were, we adopted yeah. these resources uh, nine years ago. All right. And these were the first ones that were out and, and getting into it. Ultimately, they were, they, they were not up to par. And, and the publishers have learned over the time uh, and what is the best resources. And that's what actually 2015 is when this, uh, the Ed Report site that came out. So it started evaluating because like, they were seeing that some of these resources were not up to par. So having that independent evaluator helps us make an informed decision that we're not just dependent on when our own individual uh, groups of teachers and our search committee looking at those resources. So yeah. having a more broad and outside and internal view was, was very helpful. Thank you. Ms. Guernsey. Hi, thanks so much for this presentation and all the effort that went into it. I just have one quick question, and this might have been in the link. I, I didn't see a link to further documentation, so I'll go back and look at that. But the three new courses, are those semester length courses then or full year? Full year. And, and the ones that are offered now, you said, were semester-based. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. Sorry. Just one quick question, because I'm relatively new to this. But the transition to college mathematics course, I understand what it's trying to do. Just to put it into perspective, what are the students who are you targeting for this course? What are they do currently doing in the current curriculum? Like, what classes would they be? Well, I mean, this course is actually built to be a fourth-year course. So uh, students are based off of how they're performing through, say, the, the Algebra two, but then also going into uh, seeing how they're performing on some of the standardized measures. Can I help identify is, do we need to provide more support to provide them an opportunity to show their demonstration of, uh, of college and career readiness? 
which is really kind of getting at is if safe students has not say has not met our our, our graduation requirement as uh, identified uh, through some of our standardized measures this may be a course this will be a course that really supports them that we can actually use to show that they've met the let the mastery based requirement um, of uh, uh, for their graduation requirement does that make sense right it yes for next year but I'm just asking currently what have we been doing with the the students maybe who aren't meeting the graduation requirements like what well our our current our current our current juniors are the ones that are up for the, the, the different graduation requirements our current seniors are not so th this was our, our plan to help support and provide the support to our, our current juniors when we get to them as seniors next year of, of a course that helps uh, um, them meet that graduation requirement if they have not met it because one of the things we've identified in that policy, there's alternate ways to provide a, uh, kind of a mastery based if they have not mess, met, met the testing requirement. This is our plan to actually to do that. I'm sorry, just one more question unrelated to that. It's back to the textbooks, because uh, like Mrs. Gerber, I also have a little bit of sticker shock on that page. Um, and this is probably common knowledge to everyone, but I just need to ask. Um, I'm assuming this is both digital and hard copy, and I only ask that because I don't know if, I'm a paper person, everybody makes fun of me, I like paper, but my students, my kids who are in Fairfield Public Schools, right now I have just now seen her geometry book sitting on her bedroom floor, and prior to that I have yet to see um, a textbook come home, and when I've subbed in the middle schools in particularly, if I looked over on the shelf in the math classroom, there are stacks of these books that are probably published in 2012 or 2016, where I guarantee you I could have walked over to every single one of them and the bindings would have cracked. So I just don't know if there's been, it's, I'm just throwing that out there. The, based off of the uh, um, communication with the publishers, th there's a print and digital option that comes with all of them. Um, so especially they they be able to um, use say, say at the secondary level their Chromebooks because there is a digital platform that pretty much has the same thing online. But we also have a number of students that do like having the paper, and there are a lot of teachers that are using the paper. Um, the things that come with these resources also are student workbooks. So there's this, a lot of the things that are already pre-printed for the, the the students to be able to use in the classroom, and also with the teachers. So the teacher is not going to be standing at the copier making copies of the activity they're trying to trying to use that day. So it comes, I think, with a, uh, the balance of both, um, based off of what the, the, the teachers need to support the effective instruction that we're looking at, looking for. Just to follow up on that, um, is it an option to just put, uh, purchase digital, digital access, and is there the price differential? I, 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 there's always an option, right, especially now in our digital age. Um, but one of the things that the publishers have also learned along the way is, and all my communication with publishers over time is, uh, they usually charge about, about the same amount. Because um, it's, it's just something that they, they, they initially did years ago. I, you, it's cheaper to get the digital option, but they found that they, I mean, I'm just being a, a, a capitalist society, is they, they were not making the return on the investment they had. So, a lot of times when they, they give the digital license, it's, it's, it's nearly it's, the same thing. Right, it's not, a cost, it's not a cost savings that you might think it is. Like for example, I, I, for example the plan for the pre-calculus is actually to go with um, uh, classroom sets and also the digital kind of access for all students. They nearly gave me the same price when I, when I was pricing it out. It was fairly nominal. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Max Canelli. If I could, I just want to make a sure. comment about the digital. Um, as we are in the process of getting ready to bring to the board next month uh, a 22-23 budget proposal, and we dealt with this issue last year, as the board will remember, um, the problem with the digital text um, is the recurring cost. We're on a 10-year re uh, curriculum review cycle when the uh, digital text is on a five or a six-year um, uh, payment, you are going to be into that cost again in subsequent years. Um, text, the, the hard copy text, does not have that recurring cost. So it's just one of the things that we always have to consider. And, and we've learning to consider as we start to make these purchasing decisions. Um, I know that it contributes to backpack weight and other things that go back and forth. But 
it's there and you bought it. Um, and you don't have to you don't have to re-up the license on it in six years. So there's just one of the things that we're we're thinking about as we develop budgets and we've had conversations with Dr. Rasmussen regarding this. Ms. Mescanelli, followed by Ms. Jacobson. Um, if you have a follow-up, I have a lot of questions. So if I can, happy to defer to Ms. Jacobson first. Mine is just on the digital piece. Um, so it's a follow-up, Jen, if that's okay. Um, I think I remember Nancy talking about the Chromebooks and the limitation in terms of a split screen and being able to pull up a digital textbook and actually be able to do work on a split screen. Like, in other words, there's some limitation, especially on the screen size, too, that can be complicated, especially for younger kids in trying to manipulate a digital text versus a hard copy, I think. But for That's even correct. older kids, too. So yes, just wanted to share right. that kind of, of viewpoint. Does, definitely okay. plays a part, yep. Thanks. Ms. Max Canelli? Um, first, I want to follow up on that as well. So are you saying that there is a difference in cost between that online licensing so that if in six years we decided to switch solely to the textbooks which we would have already purchased, there would be a savings there? Yes. But that in purchasing these textbooks now, we might as well also get the digital component? That's correct. Okay. Um, and I, I would be interested in knowing if for any of the books there is some differential. Um, it, I, I'm not questioning the, the nominal, but I, I would be interested if, if you could take a look just so we know, because we are heading right into the budget. Um, i just check off my questions as I go. Um, one question I had about the big ideas, just to follow up on that rating, because I, I do recall rave reviews about the big ideas when we did approve it last time. Um, so are, are you saying that that was solely based on, and I'm not criticizing that because you, you, we can only make do with what we have, that was based solely on internally created rubrics and staff assessment as opposed to this type of independent Analysis. I would I would also add that mainly because of it was one of the only resources out there, so that was actually provided some alignment to what we were trying to teach. So we we adopted the resources at a very early stage of the Common Core standards. Since then, the publishers and the authors have caught up. Uh, the, the seeing more and more uh, kind of gathering those resources, the different publishers have come out and they've updated them. And they've gotten better and better over time. Now, we're nine years down the road here. So mm -hmm. seeing as like it, it, it met the need for the time, but now is the time to, I think we need to provide, we need to provide our teachers with the tools that are, that are that, what I'd say, even better uh, now that, that have been developed since that. So. so it's not that the standards have changed at, the, at this point in time. It is the idea of catching up with the textbook. So th thank you. That makes sense. Um, and I wish my questions were, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be going forward and backward between the elementary and uh, the secondary. Um, one question I had about these course names for the high schools. Are these names that colleges would recognize? And by recognize, that slash respect. Uh, I would think so, because a number like the, the, the advanced mathematical decision making, I mean, in my research, it, it has been approved by multiple states. Okay. I mean, I, I believe, I, I can go back, I think Milford has this course already um, at their high school. Milford has implemented this course before I left there in 2015. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the Transition to College Math is a new course that is really come out, that is developed, I think, in 20, uh, 2020. So it is something that, uh, that we will develop, and that goes into the development and on those transcripts that ultimately is to provide. I think that course name actually benefits is because they're, they're prepared prepare for the students for college. I think it really kind of, that, that name I think is beneficial, personally. Well, I actually had a question about that name because, I, and I'm, I have not recently had to look into math course offerings in colleges, but I don't believe there's any such course called college math. And therefore, transition to college math means it is what? Well, the, specifically, that there, there are college math, they actually call it college algebra. There's, there's a number of uh, courses at the college level that actually, I mean, there's, uh, so that, that is one specifically that I know off the top of my head. I was actually talking to a teacher about that today that was that college algebra actually has college algebra in the name. So it's... No, but algebra makes sense to me. Yeah. Math is what doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, no, math makes sense to me. But as part of the uh, title, uh, college math is not a course they're going to be taking. Yeah. So therefore, transition to that yep. doesn't exist. And so that's, that was part of my concern there. Also part of my... And I do... I respect the idea that it's coming after Algebra 2 mm -hmm. because, of course, Algebra 2 is what they're going to be assessed on on that SAT. Mm -hmm. But to a degree, isn't in terms of addressing student need, is there any aspect of this course that actually would have made sense for it to be prior to Algebra 2? 
I think uh, that's something we could uh, look at in terms of what's the best need, the best the need for our students. But again, what we want to provide students with the opportunity uh, and the math background to be successful on that. So I think the, the SAT goes for numerous different topics, from uh, eighth grade all the way through algebra two. So there's it, it can provide a need beyond just what, what our algebra two actually provides. As, as the students, if they are looking to go on to college, this will prepare them down the line for this uh, and support them for their needs um, to, to be successful in college. And th so that's what the purpose of that course was developed. And especially when we were talking with the director of the Dana Center, she, 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 they are very excited about the development of that course to very meet the, meet the needs of the, the, the students related to preparing them for college. Okay, so I, I want to hear more about the Dana, because that was one of my other questions, is who, who are these people? I mean, what is this group? Because um, it's obviously they're referenced twice, so yep. I'm interested more in that. But back to the transition to college math, does it require Algebra two as a prerequisite to take it? It is meant to be a fourth year. So yes, it is meant to be as, as the students go on and they leave Algebra two, and they, and they need more support, and, it, and it's not shown that they, um, they're ready for college math, this is the course that's going to support them. So what do we have for the student who's taken Algebra one, Geometry, and is not meeting with success, and their next option is an Algebra two course for which they are not prepared? Yeah, so, so I, 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 I was actually talking to one of my department heads about that. Is this, we may, this could be that option to support those students to be successful. We will continue to look at that in terms of uh, providing those student support. So, um, we could actually, in terms of dividing that course sequence, we may look at that. But ultimately, so the development of this course is meant to be a fourth year course, um, especially with our discussion with the Dana Center. They're, they're very adamant is that's a course that's hands on, really needed for those students to be successful at the college level. And that's what it's meant for beyond algebra, uh, beyond algebra two. Okay, and so again, that, that's my concern, because I, I recall well, we've heard over the years, in fact, we have one of the teachers here who's brought it to our attention numerous times, concern even about the notion of some of our ninth graders taking Algebra one in a single year. And so I'm interested in what are we doing to support them, because if they don't have that down, those next two, three years, or whatever that they commit to math, that they choose to commit to math with our, with our graduation requirements, are going to be brutally difficult. So it, it's... And, and we, we, know, we know there's a tremendous need out there, and so I'm, I'm just not hearing how we're addressing that. I, I mean, I think that's, that's ultimately that's a different issue. We do what we're talking about. How are we supporting students to be successful in grade level expectations? I think we, we are always continuing and working with the building leadership to how we finding different ways to support our students to be successful in, a, uh, in our current Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2. And I think that we, we are always, and we're still committed to related to that for in our, in our intervention services. And we're always continuing to look to provide different ways to provide students to be successful in grade level courses. I'm not a big believer in, in actually creating a two year algebra course that actually creates greater inequity. I'll be honest with you directly. That does not close the achievement gap. It actually widens the achievement gap. The better way to approach is to find ways and different structures to support the students to be successful in the grade level course not create a greater inequities. And are we finding that those methods that we're pursuing are achieving success? Because, well, I have no interest in, I hear your point about the two year, and if there's data showing that that's not the path, then I have no interest in it. But is what we are doing, like what are some recent things we are doing to serve those students not achieving success in a conventional one year Algebra one course? So I can see Excuse specific me, Mr. Rasmus, uh, just to, in the absence of Mrs. Vitale, Mr. Cummings wanted to make a comment on your last. Yeah, I had, I had to go to the vice chair. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think that, Inspector Kelly, the, the, your line of questioning rightfully gets at this readiness issue and the intervention level. And, uh, and I know our next presentation from the middle school uh, administration team is, talks about uh, uh, the development of a middle school schedule that should, um, one of its core objectives is to build into the schedule that opportunity to intercede and intervene with student math needs at an earlier age so that the issue isn't being fixed in ninth grade, it should be fixed ahead of ninth grade. But I know Dr. Rusman is also about to speak to um, a, a program approach that Mr. Kavan implemented this year at Ward that um, is an attempt to address this issue as well. So I don't want to interrupt that. He's also conveniently sitting in the back, but that's, I'm not 
I wasn't going to call him out. But this actually did. what it came to because ultimately we like to kind of uh, dive into what, what the literature says, what's the best to support students. NCTM does not support a two-year Algebra 1. Does not support. I'm not advocating for. I want to know let, we're doing something that's working. Let, so just let, to be clear, let, I am not let, advocating let for that. Let me get into this, please. Ultimately, is the better approach, just like we were talking about with uh, with Mr. Cabana, is, is to do an extended, say, uh, a support class that goes along. They have an extended Algebra One course that meets for a half uh, uh, to support the learning that's going on in the Algebra One course. That is the better approach. That that does not create greater inequities. And, and we, we believe in, in, in intervention, and we believe in supporting students to be um, a successful in grade level content. And that's the approach that we have taken in terms of supporting uh, those students to be supported in the Algebra One. We, we've invested in our, our support services in terms of our geometry also. It, well, we, we've had a, uh, an intervention course that goes along with our geometry, and also one for Algebra Two. The better approach is to support the students to be successful and not hold them back, create, make greater inequities along the way. And I guess I'll, I'll wrap that line of questioning up. The point being is that when you come back for your update, you know, assuming all this goes, you know, moves ahead, an update in four to five years, the logical question from that board will be, is the, did these interventions work? And what's being adjusted to obviously make sure that they can meet with that success? Um, these uh, three new uh, courses, do you anticipate they'll be NCAA approved? Yes. Okay. Because they're, um, they're above Algebra 1. Okay. Um, out, Concerning bridges, um, I'm curious why we are staying with it. And I'm not saying that because I'm suggesting we change. But obviously, that took a very long time for this district to arrive at that uh, resource um, after a few years of wrangling and much public debate over how we should be approaching elementary school math. So I'm wondering what you looked at. I, I actually would like to see for the next meeting some comparative data across districts of what their approach has been with their resource and what is it that supports our continuing with bridges. And I want, again, I want to be clear, I'm not looking to be contentious about that and I'm not saying I disagree with it, but I would like the affirmation that we have made the right selection because there are certainly several choices um, and I'd like to see that ours has met with success. Thank you. Um, now, sorry to get into the PowerPoint. I'll try to do this more quickly. Ms. Maxa Kelly, can I just, uh, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to answer that question and, and we can do that research for you. But I think one of the things that we considered as we had these conversations is, uh, and you pointed it out, that the uh, selection of bridges took some time and it's taken even further time that once it was adopted to, to it's a heavy, it's a program that's heavy on the professional learning required of staff. Um, one of the things that we wanted to be conscious of as we move into essentially the second iteration of the Common Core Standards, right, now with math and later with ELA, is um, that the, the new learning, in a sense, of the standards and pacing and all the things that have come with that, while it will continue, the focus needs to be on the deepening of instruction. And when we think about the cost-benefit analysis of a, of a new resource, setting aside the expense for that resource, the time we spend with staff, do we want to spend it on um, developing an understanding of new resources and the nooks and crannies of a new resources, new resource, or do we want to take what we know and deepen the work within what we know so that we can actually get to the professional practices that will change math instruction and raise in student achievement. So uh, we will get the data for you, but I think that's one, of the, I just want to put that in a larger context because we deal with this with all the time. We, these are questions we need to ask every time we uh, approach a new curriculum now. Thank you, and, and I do appreciate that because I, I do overwhelmingly remember that this was something that was quite time intensive uh, in terms of what was asked of our staff. Um, regarding the, uh, the, the, the challenge resources. Um, I just want to reiterate the point that several board members made at the last meeting regarding Math Academy. Um, and I'm not looking to embark on a Math Academy debate right now. Um, I have, you know, again, I fervently support that program. I would continue into the future. I'm not saying that's the will of the board. But what I do think the will of the board was and the expectation of the board was, which we articulated last meeting, is that we weren't looking for challenge resources. We had been promised last January that there would be a replacement program involving acceleration in the elementary school. And obviously now is kind of the time that we need that data because it would involve a budget investment. And 
so I, I, and if I'm alone on this, I hope that the rest of the board will put me in my place in that. But I, I do believe that that was the will of the board last time. We want to know what it would take to have the acceleration. Um, it's what we expected last January when we made the amendment to the budget to continue the math academy for one year. Um, and so I'm not seeing any of that in this. And I think that's a fervent interest of the board, but that's my perception. One other question I had uh, regarding the uh, professional development needed in the elementary school. Um, I was curious, you say focus on professional development to address needs around equity. And I was wondering with what focus is that? You know, what, what is the data behind that that we, because I would hope this is really targeted work here, but that's a very vague statement. And I was wondering if you could add some color to that. Right. It's, um, if we're looking, this is part of the reason we started off with our math practice standards and how are we providing all kids with opportunities and access to the content within uh, the core classroom instruction. Um, students feeling comfortable in taking risks, students feeling um, that they're able to ask questions or um, that students who feel that they already know or understand are being challenged with um, uh, deeper questions around the content that they're learning. Um, and even following, uh, finding students who uh, may be struggling with the content to um, what Dr. Rasmussen was saying, providing them with grade level access to content rather than um, uh, an approach that's often used is remediation. So it's, it's about how do we um, target the student's needs and provide them access to grade level content um, versus uh, teaching down, if you will. Um, and then also focusing our uh, efforts on differentiating up. I don't know if that answers your question, but. It, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, but maybe that's just the, the nature of the question and therefore it has to be, I mean, obviously we heard earlier that the work of our math science teachers in the elementary schools have to be focused on those students. So if that's their specialty, I'm just asking what the nature of the professional development is that our specialists need. And if it's for the classroom teacher, then why can't those specialists also be targeted on the students who need acceleration? I don't disagree with that. I said a lot there, but I like that you said you don't disagree, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll accept that and move on. Um, I, I, I'll stop there. If I have anything else, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, but thank you so much for the, the presentation. Any other questions? Thank you for the presentation and, and to all the staff that worked on this. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to the presentation, middle school block schedule update. Mr. Cummings, I will let you give the intro. All right. Um, thank you, Ms. Vitelli. I want to, um, we're going to welcome our uh, middle school principal team as well as Dr. Parrish to, um, to present on the middle school schedule. Uh, I just want to do a quick overview of this before they get into the details because <clears throat> um, this is another uh, development or initiative within the school system that has been in um, development uh, for quite some time. Even before I arrived in the district, I know that the middle school team had looked at schedule alternatives driven primarily around several factors which this, this presentation will get into. Um, those, those concerns uh, remain, they persist. Um, we were in the process and we had presented to the board um, several years ago, uh, some proposals around middle school schedule. Um, because of the concerns that were pre presented at the time, we um, held off. We were going to develop again in the 1920 school year, and of course, we know what happened then. The um, initial ideas, though, uh, concerns around the schedule were brought forward to uh, the team of uh, curricular, uh, team liaisons, excuse me, from all three middle schools in the fall of 2018, if I remember correctly, um, who identified the um, 
issues that they needed to be resolved in the schedule. We return to those same issues um, under the latest round of, um, of schedule development that's going to be presented to you tonight. So the concerns that staff had at the time remain the a focus of the work that we've been doing. Um, this, this presentation should be seen as the first public discussion of a process that will continue through the um, remaining part of the winter and into the spring. This, the presentation will talk about some of the concrete steps that the team will be doing. But this is, again, only the beginning of the work to bring a new middle school schedule forward. Um, it is, we know that um, the instructional time in the middle school, the pace of the schedule is a deterrent to student learning. And essentially what we, the schedule attempts to do is to slow the pace in order to deepen the learning. So with that said, I'll uh, remain, I'll go quiet and turn it over to, to those. Thank you for being here tonight. And I want to also thank, before I forget, um, our assistant principals from the middle school as well for all their work. The, the folks at the table take all the glory. They get the spotlight. But that group back there, they, they, did, they did a lot of the work. And I know our middle school principal will be the first to point them out. But I took that honor. So thank you. Okay. Good evening. I'm Zakia Parrish, Executive Director of Operations and Processes, and I'm joined at the table today with Principals Colleen Bannock from uh, Fairfield Woods, Anthony Fermato from Tomlinson, and uh, Meg Tiley from Roger Ludlow. As stated by Mr. Cummings, we are also joined by our assistant principals, Jody Sachs, who's not here tonight because she's at uh, a concert at Tomlinson, um, Steve D'Angelo, Karen Shaughnessy and Ken Seltzer. So those are our assistant principals who are also a part of the team that put this presentation together. Yep. Yep, it's on. It's just not. Nope. It's just working. Yeah, we can just we'll just let you know when we're ready. Next slide. There we go, thank you. So the rationale that was, was the, the focus of the, implementation of the implementation of the block schedule back several years ago when this was first presented is that the schedule that uh, is currently being utilized at the, the middle school is not really fully supporting all of the things that we want to make sure that students who are going through this middle school experience actually are able to fulfill. So our vision of the graduate, our learning expectations, as well as the curriculum itself. We really wanted to make sure that we looked at um, a schedule that would provide some additional learning opportunities for students, as well as that time for intervention and enrichment. Um, in order to do that, we had to look at the school day itself and reduce the number of transitions in order to make up for some of that instructional time. Next slide. So our guiding principles really came from the feedback that was received from the first set of presentations that were done when the original schedule drafts were, were presented to various stakeholder groups. Again, really making sure that we had a focus on increasing the overall instructional time, that we put in that time for those flexible win periods to provide all students access to intervention or enhancement that it was something that was supported by cognitive neuroscience. So we wanted to make sure that whatever schedule we chose was developmentally appropriate for the age group of the students that we were serving. That it, again, improved the pace of the day by providing those longer instructional periods, but also maintained those opportunities for collaboration, which currently exists within the middle school structure. Next slide.
No, it should be okay. Thank you, though. <laughs> and um, Anthony Fermato from Tomlinson Middle School. Um, I think Mike, uh, Mr. Cummings, really set this slide up very well. Um, there was a, a, a lot of work done uh, leading up to, to this point. Um, we were interrupted, of course, uh, by the pandemic, but this did give us the opportunity to implement a lot of the feedback that we did receive from teachers, students, parents, and the board. Uh, many uh, of the, the pieces of feedback that we received did focus around the length of the period uh, of the previously proposed schedule, which is around 88 minutes. Um, so we definitely took that feedback. Uh, that collaborative process led to the current version of the schedule, which meets the needs and guiding principles of more stakeholders more efficiently. Some of the highlights of the pre-pandemic process are listed on this slide. We gathered information from our liaison groups. This is all the way back in September of 2018. We, received, we reviewed 12 middle school schedules, and, and that number is, is really the number of schedules that we got deeply into. There were lots more schedules that we all individually looked at uh, and reviewed uh, the merits of them. Developed common questions for research, interviewed high school students because the high school had just gone through the, the block process. Um, so we definitely took advantage of the individuals in the district who went through that process. We interviewed six sites by phone. We visited two sites for more information. We went to Shelton, North Branford. Uh, those groups that went to those schools included eight teachers, two administrators. We held many community conversations. That was back in March of 2019. We conducted parent surveys. We staged the schedule in uh, with an IC consultant. Um, and we had a staff conversation. We updated the presentation uh, and we presented to the board as Mike stated. Next slide, please. So now we're on to uh, our timeline here, uh, brings us up to present. We, as I mentioned before, we took that feedback, we redesigned the schedule, so we were able to implement that feedback that we received uh, to better address the FPS needs. All schools have very different needs and run very different programs. Um, every school is a, a little bit different, so there's really no simple way to cut and paste a schedule from another district. So many times we ask the question, who's running this schedule? Where can we see it? We can see it, but um, as we heard bef and many times, you, you, if you try to accomplish something, um, you have to give something up. If you're trying to add something, you have to give something up. So we really believe that this schedule maintains our very robust, comprehensive program. It, it, it maintains the ability to offer choice. It maintains the ability to offer the great arts program that we have, um, and it really, really uh, keeps our program intact and then adds uh, a lot of learning opportunities for students. Um, I, and again, some of the things that we have to do at the beginning of this process is we have to determine very early on what the FTE special education impacts are and maintain communications with school, the teachers, the leadership teams, the faculty, the staff, the Board of Education. So a lot of that work that we're doing, we've done through the pandemic and then up to now. Now we're into the communication process and getting more feedback as we go through uh, a, a new iteration of this schedule. And as we look here on the timeline, we did work with a consultant. We were able to mock the plan up uh, in IC, our student data program. Um, management system, and we do have a proof, proof of concept that this does work, it can run, so we are able to determine what the FTE impact is. We are able now to share the schedule confidently, knowing that it works, and now we're on to, uh, obviously, our presentation tonight, and then conducting, moving forward, conducting the PD, which uh, is similar to some of the, the experiences that we had going from uh, the regular schedule to a block schedule at the high school level. Um, so th that should be very similar. Um, we could definitely use that information um, from that experience. So for the faculty and the staff, the similar process that we used at the high school level, we'll work on lesson design. We have to teach in a longer block. We'll be planning multiple activities that last 15 to 20 minutes so that students are, are always engaged. We're designing lessons that have a variety of structure and different models, pre-assessment, direct instruction, 
practice applications, self-paced work, use of playlists, menus, discussion, project-based learning, jigsaw use of technology, could be Edpuzzle uh, as an example, writing, conferencing, using small group instruction, goal setting, and reflection. The ultimately, good teaching is good teaching. Um, we plan on doing uh, pilot days. When we did this at the high school, it was those were some of the most valuable experiences. We gained a lot of information, and we were able to make adjustments with the pilot days. Um, and then we'll finalize the schedule, make sure we're communicating to our rising 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students and their families. Uh, in conclusion, it's a massive undertaking just to get to this point to build an entire schedule and analyze it to make sure it works. The next slide will show a summary of the scheduling considerations, and these are in addition to the guiding principles that Dr. Parrish referenced before. And scheduling considerations, as you can see, we do want to maintain our program, as I mentioned before. We also, not listed on here, is the teacher contract that we have to adhere to. Um, and some of the, the highlights, obviously, that you're hearing tonight about choice and accelerated math students we have to take into account, shared staff across the district, uh, world language offerings and choice, making sure that we maintain that. Core classes, we had to decide what the order was. Do we lock them? Do we not have to lock them? Uh, UA electives, PE class, and then how do we maintain our reading supports for our students? Uh, Learning Center, of course, I mentioned, uh, or I didn't mention, I apologize, special education service time is also a consideration. And then our scheduling framework in the next slide. We are working on uh, a one bell schedule. We looked at many, many um, schedules that use multiple bell schedules. So it's very difficult to share staff when you use multiple bell schedules. So we were able to get it down to one bell schedule. Every class will be 67 minutes, every period, I apologize, every period will be 67 minutes long. All periods will be the exact same length. That helps with scheduling. The, you'll have five blocks per day. Two periods will be dropped and not meet on that day. Classes meet five times in a seven day rotation. We'll use the letters A through G, which is very similar to what the elementary schools are doing. Uh, in a seven-day rotation, one period will be designated as a win period. Win is, stands for what I need. And then right now, we're considering to keep snow days. They will not change the schedule. We will rotate A through G, uh, and we'll create a calendar similar, again, to what the high school is doing. So this, uh, Colleen Bannock from Fairfield Woods Middle. Um, this slide goes through the instructional co time comparison given our current schedule, um, time constraints versus the block schedule. Um, we Everything in here should be expressed in a seven day um, expression of time. There is one box in here that of course after we sent it to the board there's an error, so I'll correct it as we go through the slide. Um, the first box, however, is not that area. So instructional minutes over seven days, um, it's a comparison of 322 right now to 335 in the block. Um, again, it's, the, it's over a seven-day rotation, but it meets five times uh, in our current schedule, and it would meet five times out of the seven in the proposed schedule. Um, the second section is where just a small revision has to be made. Number of instructional minutes for PE and music over seven days. Um, it's the reason the revision needs to be made is because P, B, the amount of times that PE and music are offered each week, um, now given over a seven day rotation, it's going to be a slightly different. And so um, the math that, that I actually did with my staff today takes an average number and it is within three or four minutes of the current, um, of the, the, excuse me, our current schedule and the block schedule would be almost an identical time. So there's really no change there. Um, <clears throat> the instructional minutes over the school year, you can see the comparison there. Um, the next piece here, though, I think is really critical. The number of transitions per day from eight to six may not seem like a huge change, but when you have to get up, move, bring all your things, make sure you have your stuff, do you know where your homework is, do I have time to stop at my locker, um, all of those things, it does make a difference when you only have to do that six times as opposed to eight times. 
Um, it just makes a difference in the hustle and bustle for our adolescent students. And the transition time there bears that out in the very next column or uh, row. Uh, the instructional minutes are um, increased in the blood the way that the block schedule is being proposed in this. This does include the win period as instructional time. And that is also inclusive of the planning and meeting time per seven days also increases. Next slide, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Meg Tiley, principal at Roger Ludlow Middle School. And I, Mr. Cummings, I think stole, stole the thunder on thanking our assistant principals for being here. Um, they were essential in this process. Um, I want to highlight uh, an earlier slide and some of our uh, guiding principles. And, and those are that increased access to interventions for all students. Our middle level currently uses a 24 minute, some of you have experienced uh, what we call the flex block during our homeroom uh, period. And this is a time for students to meet with teachers if needed. Um, this new schedule, we are again back to our guiding principles, looking for opportunities for collaboration and provide flexibility for adjustments to meet students' needs. I'm gonna be describing what the win or what I need period is and what it looks like for students and teachers in the slides ahead. Um, and, and, a little forward in the presentation, we're gonna be highlighting some sample student and teacher schedules. Next slide, Meg, if you could. Thanks. Uh, sorry, Meg, back up one. Thank you. Uh, the win period, what is it and what does it look like? Um, it's an acceleration block that again provides extended learning time with acceleration period for each day. We're gonna to refer to this as the, the win period or what I need. As, as Mr. Fermato said, each period is approximately 67 minutes. One class per day has a win period in each grade level. During that block, that, in, that includes the win period, teachers may introduce new content or information during the first 33 minutes. And, that's, that's, and uh, the, the other 33 minutes is used for that win period. The win period create, creates additional time and opportunities for students and teachers to connect over their content and win period provides to all students in all grades across all classes. Again, it, it allows all students to receive supports they would have received during homeroom, but in every class. Again, students identified needing extra support in reading, writing, math, and executive functioning and study skills would receive additional support during the win period. I, I wanna be very clear in this point that, and I keep, emphasizing all students, all students actively participate in the win period. These periods allow time for varying levels of, of supports and engagement specific to each student. So some students may receive reading, writing, math, executive functioning, possibly outside of the classroom. And then those students that maybe need a, a lesser tier of that support would receive that support from their classroom teacher of the classroom they're in. So. Um, and I'll move on from there. Um, students also may work sometimes independently, sometimes in small groups, and sometimes with teachers one-on-one. -on -one. Next slide, Meg. So um, again, these win periods are more flexible than core content classes. Um, they provide more opportunities to personalize teaching and learning. Students who have proficiency gaps from previous grades can work to fill them during this time while still being exposed to grade level content and not further falling behind in it. It also creates additional time for students and teachers to meet and discuss their progress and any possible modifications that could be made to help them. Students can move in and out of this win period. So I may need support for a period of time in writing where I may be pulled out, someone may push into my classroom, the classroom teacher may support that writing initiative if I'm pulled out, I, there may be a period of time that I come back in. So it gives us much more flexibility and allows many options for time depending on the need. The, the number one thing that we hear from teachers when you put a, a survey out is, you know, what do you need? The number one answer is time. And, and I believe this schedule really finds more time for students and for teachers in collaborating. Um, new concepts will not be introduced during the win period. So that fear of, Students that do move out of the classroom for a level three support, they would not be missing new concepts. 
So um, students identified as needing extra reading support, they may leave the classroom and receive targeted instru instruction, again, I said this, in reading, writing, math, and executive functioning study skills. The teachers and students remaining in the classroom could do individual coaching, pull small groups, prompt students to work through a Google Classroom, all depending on their progress, learning preferences, and instructional needs. Again, this is meeting students where they are at and what their needs are for interventions. We have a series of teacher must-dos, and again, our teachers do this, but this is, this is commonplace. Teachers must create system structures and routines for students. This is very important at the middle level. We also want to emphasize this is not a study hall. It's, it is very targeted. Teachers must ensure that time spent uh, is spent with the right group of students on the right activities, and teachers must make note of students in their regular classes that might need additional support whether it's something as simple as a makeup test or assignment, something likely more complicated that is like remediating a lesson they missed or providing additional opportunities for spiraling skills. So it can reach those students not only in need of support, but perhaps those kids that need that little bit of extra. The win periods may do. Teachers may provide opportunities for students to work flexibly in an, in an independent project so we could perhaps pursue uh, students' passions. Flexible learning would not need to be a one-size-fits-all experience. Teachers may pull small reinforcement groups or conduct individual conferences on current work. Teachers may offer a variety of instructional activities, including content review, skill practice, and longer-term projects. For example, students may reinforce what they learned in the must-do task with certain, certain math games or online content as well as content that challenges them further within that sp specific learning goal. Teachers may also assign longer term assignments that students need to complete over several weeks. This win period allows for some student voice and choice in the classroom. Personalized learning spaces with students at the center of their learning. We are looking to increase student engagement and strengthen the academic social support for all types of learners and needs in this model. The win period, the, as far as frequency of when does the win meet for each of those core subject areas, as you can see by the chart, six to seven times per term. This chart is per term. For PE, it would be three win periods, music four win periods, and for unified arts, six to seven win periods. Now we are on to sample schedules. There are multiple sample schedules within the packet that you received. So for um, purpose of discussion, I'd like to ask Meg that we just stay on this one for right now. Um, we have gotten some feedback from staff that the color coding may be a bit much, but our hope in this presentation is that it does allow you to see how the periods move across the week. Um, that was the piece that we just needed that to be as clear as possible of how many periods is it and how does that move across the week. Um, <clears throat> you can see the 67 minute block as it plays out. Uh, the drops are noted at the top of each schedule. We were able after some feedback with our staff to make some tweaks in the A through E schedule, excuse me, the A through G schedule um, so that we don't have bookend classes dropping at the same time. So as an example, um, the G day drops periods four and seven, the A day drops three and six. So you don't have, um, a repeated drop two days in a row. Um, considerations certainly for if you, um, if you are not seeing your students on a Friday, right, you will not see them again until Monday. So the, there is a concern, a concern, you know, voiced by the staff around the, the timing of weekends. Right? We just had a discussion about that today. Um, and just we discussed that weekends happen now and that those are things that we would have to, you know, move forward through with our planning to make sure that we're, um, we're planning instructionally um, appropriately to match those, those gaps that may occur. Um, the other thing that this colored schedule does really well is demonstrates the fact that we're all on the same time schedule across the building. So this allows us to maintain things like common planning time um, for our staff, uh, common times for students to receive intervention at a particular grade level. So the, as an example, so this is the sample for grade six. All grade student, all grade six students are available for win support during that period seven on A day, during that period four on B day. So this allows us to deploy 
our interventionists, um, of, which, of which some increased FTE request will be a piece, um, that our sixth graders would then be able to access that win period and all of our specialists at the same time, but only one grade level at a time because trying to come up with a singular intervention block does not maximize our use of staff. And so by staggering it through the day, we're able to maximize our use of staff across the day. And it also increases our ability to utilize those staff for push-in opportunities within, for just-in-time intervention in the classroom. Um, Meg, we can keep going, I think. That summarizes the student piece. We can, yeah, let, we can stop again here. Thank you so much. Um, we also thought it was important to highlight for the board the, uh, what a sample teacher day would look like. So this is just, an, again, just for the purposes of discussion here, grade six social studies. Uh, this demonstrates how um, the instructional time plays out over the course of the week. Uh, again, same periods. There is the common planning time. So those periods in yellow are common planning time for the grade level, not just for the content area. So we've been, again, we've been able to maintain that common planning time that is a huge strength of the middle school model and allows our teachers to stay in a similar place in the curriculum. And then we have greater consistency, not just within one building, but across buildings. One of the other pieces that would have to um, occur should the schedule come into, um, be put into place is that we would have greater alignment across all three buildings with regard to how the schedule rotation moves. The reason that that's so beneficial is it maximizes our ability to share staff across middle schools and with the high school because of the locked periods at the start and the end of um, almost every single day. In addition, the meeting times would be the same at a particular grade level across the town, meaning there is increased opportunity for departmental and grade level communication um, especially now with all the digital options that we have um, at our disposal for meeting times. Sorry, Meg, one sec. So this goes on with multiple schedule examples um, and takes us to FTE request. I, I got it. They, they gave the old dog principal the budget stuff. <laughs> uh, Meg, you, there we go. Thank you. Um, so the FTE request on, in this model is a 4.6 uh, need to support that win period and, and the interventions, both pull out, push in. Um, you will see 2.2 at Fairfield Woods and 2.2 at Roger Ludlow, each asking for an additional math resource teacher and an ad additional language arts teacher. And then across all three levels, uh, a point two request, in some cases world language, and in some cases it's a music or PE request. Um, I do want to point out, and some of you were, were on the board during our 2019 proposal, um, and it, during that proposal we were looking at an eight to 12 FTE request at each school. So this is a significant reduction um, in that budget request. Um, and I, Colleen already said this, but keep in mind that our intervention, interventionists are scheduled throughout the day to maximize in, our pull in and push in, pull out and push in supports. As I mentioned, as I mentioned before, uh, on the PD side, um, this is definitely something that we're planning on and considering the needs of the teachers uh, to, to make sure that they feel comfortable with this new schedule. So we'll be focusing on teacher, teaching and supporting students in a 67 minute period, as I mentioned before. We'll focus with teachers uh, to successfully utilize the win period to support students. That's going to rely heavily on planning. Uh, as Colleen was mentioning with the schedule, we maintain that opportunity to collaborate, um, which is really important on the, the middle school level. Um, there are some challenges with this schedule. Uh, when the win period is in play, it does uh, interrupt some of the consistency that middle school teachers do have and do enjoy, which is different from a high school teacher if you have multiple preps. High school teachers are used to having multiple preps um, and middle school teachers, this is something that will be different for them or new. Um, that's what the, the win period may 
play a part on where teachers are feeling like their classes, they have five classes, are at different points. So it'll feel like new preps for teachers. And that is something that we are aware of and will work with teachers uh, with their professional learning. That's okay. And continuing on the professional learning schedule, we have uh, our faculty meetings coming up in January. And as you can see on the schedule here, we're planning to use those for professional learning, as well as being supported from our program directors and department meetings. And a lot of that work has already begun. Um, just, you know, in the, in the past few weeks, we've already been discussing uh, using small groups and really working on uh, keeping students actively engaged. And that is all very, very applicable uh, in a 67 minute period. As I said before, good teaching is good teaching. We consider this um, next piece to be really pivotal in our ability to ensure that as the schedule gets implemented on the first day of the school year next year, we know what it looks like and we know how it feels from both the student perspective and the staff perspective. So our plan is to follow a similar um, MO as when the high schools rolled these, um, this new schedule out. We'd like to run two different sets of pilot days. Um, right now, this is set at two full days. There's still some discussion with our staffs to see how many of the days of the rotation we would need to run to really feel like we get a feel for what it truly will be. Um, but the concept of this would, would remain the same. It would be a first pilot run, feedback from both staff and students, so that any tweaks or changes that need to be made can be made, and then another pilot run, so that we can then test out those tweaks and see if they've made a difference. Um, this mentions including music and PE in the pilot days and ensure the cores have the win period. The nature of the schedule ensures that that would happen on any day of the rotation. Um, our thought would be that including perhaps a few extra days in the pilot days just would allow us to work out any, um, any hiccups that may come up that are, you know, that I see itself wouldn't predict. Um, and again, to utilize the time in between the phases to make revisions as needed. And then just in, in that's okay. In closing, uh, just going back to our timeline, so you can see where we are um, currently in November, December, uh, making the presentation, communicating with the staff, and then uh, conducting the PD going forward, communicating with our families and our stakeholders, getting students involved in the process, and as Colleen just said, doing the pilot days, and then finalizing the schedule in our articulation process as we move forward for the next school year. Thank you. that wipe, wipe everyone up. Thank you so much for this presentation. I'm sure um, there's a lot to process there. Um, I don't know if anybody has any initial questions now. Mrs. Gerber, followed by Ms. Gerber. Thanks very much for the presentation. And thanks to you guys over there too. <laughs> um, so uh, one, one quick question, I, I have a, a fair amount of questions, but one thing I just was curious about, because um, it's always been a topic with middle school, um, is the pull-out music lessons. Um, how does this, or does this new schedule address that? So it, it, it does and it doesn't. So the is the wind period possibly able to be used for some music lessons? Yes. So would that mitigate the need for some lessons to not come out of a core class or another class, yes. Can we accommodate all music lessons in that win period across the, the seven days? No, we cannot. So some of the pullout would continue to exist. 
the, sorry, the only thing I would add to that is um, with a longer period, the, the music lesson is traditionally 20, 30 minutes. It would give the student the opportunity to get back for a, a bigger portion of the class. Okay, so in this case, they wouldn't be missing as much of the class as they do with the current schedule. Um, and then, and I'm sure a lot of people have questions, and it's getting late, and we've got a lot going on here, so I, I want to make this brief. Um, I, I guess my, my concern is the same now that it was a few years back, is that while I'm a huge fan of the block schedule in high school, um, I had one child who had three years of the non-block schedule and one year of the block, and then my younger daughter, my younger child had four years of block, and I really so saw the value of it in so many ways. And I really feel like there, there was a goal because a lot of kids weren't having lunch and the lunch period is too long and you did get a lot more, considerable more instructional time over the course of a year. Um, and there were also high school students. I just worry um, because there's such a huge gulf between sixth graders and eighth graders. And I think having eighth graders have the schedule would actually be a huge benefit because then it wouldn't be such a huge change when they get to high school. And, and I, I, I understand, I, I can't, I, I don't think that it would be possible to be able to just have the eighth graders do it because you know that people are doing different courses and everything like that. But I do truly worry that it just would be too much for sixth graders and, and even some se seventh graders as well. So, I, you know, I, we don't need to get into a whole long discussion, but that's just something that's always been a concern of mine when we've discussed this in the past and just wanted to kind of put that out there. I'm gonna give it to the superintendent before. I know this, this concern comes up frequently and I, I wanna point out um, that I, I think we would all agree that if if we continue to teach the way we, we are somewhat forced to do in a 45 minute period when you have to take attendance and then teach and then and, and assign homework and do all the other check-ins, there's a rush to that 45 minutes that really promotes a lot of teacher-directed instruction. I know our teachers are working against that model as much as they can, but some of the schedule, so much of the schedule dictates that instructional approach. Um, as, as the board well knows, we never call it this at, in an elementary school, but the elementary school has had a block schedule for decades, essentially. You know, we have 90-minute to two-hour reading blocks. We have a 60-minute math instructional period. Um, what the difference is, is that those those teachers for years have worked to vary the instructional strategies, do different grouping uh, methodologies, um, pull groups for small group instruction, and kids do independent reading, however it may work. And the key, is, as our um, leadership team has pointed out, will be the professional learning we provide teachers so that the 67 minutes offer a variety of activities. Um, I know our teachers have expressed frustration against what the model currently does to them, and there will be ability in a longer block to vary the instructional strategies to counter that, uh, to address those concerns. Bring it back to the panel if you have anything to add. I think it's just important to note too that there's a, um, a significant portion of our students that are, are cut out of being included in all of our offerings given the current constraints, uh, the constraints of our current schedule. Um, so just at Woods, we have 744 students registered right now and 160 of them are in a class that take them out of world language. Not all of those students need to not be taking a language, but because of our current model of intervention and specific to reading in this case, um, they're stuck in a five day a week class that they may not actually need all the instructional time in there. We have students everywhere from um, needing you know, very significant high level Wilson support. Um, and we have students who really just need to brush up on comprehension. And they're being offered the same five day model. So a huge thrust here was attempting to offer more flexibility with our intervention in hopes of lessening the stress, certainly not adding to it. Ms. Guernsey. Um, hi, thank you so much for this presentation. And I know um, this has been a lot of effort over many, many years, so that's greatly appreciated. Um, I was a part of the parent process on that end of the world language, um, I mean, sorry, 
about the black schedule um, when it was first introduced. And so um, I'm making a lot of comparisons to that schedule and certainly it's greatly improved. And I would add to that, that I can see it's very clear what the benefits are for the students that benefit from the in intervention services. Um, it's not so clear to me what some of the other students that don't need in intervention, how they benefit. And some of my concerns, um, are, are sort of repeated from from the past in that um, while it's not a block schedule where um, classes are every other day, you're still you still miss two days. Um, you know the schedule. I'm sorry, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but um, this idea that um, there was a number of research that showed uh, pretty clearly that for certain subjects like math and world language, repetition was such an important component of that. Um, so you know, clearly that's something that that we're losing some of with the schedule. So um, you know, what I'm thinking about is I'm seeing the benefits of it, and certainly have highlighted those in this presentation. But I think there are a number of trade-offs too, and I, it's important to address those, I think. Um, and one of the other things I'm thinking about is when we talk about the instructional time comparisons um, and the current schedule versus the block schedule, uh, it sort of looks like from this chart that we're getting more time with the block schedule. But if you subtract the win time, um, which isn't instructional time where you're moving forward, um, I, I just did some quick math, and you would be losing over 30 hours of core instructional time over the course of the year. So to me, that's a significant um, consideration for our students that need to move forward with these courses. So um, that's a concern of mine. Um, you addressed, uh, so just thinking again about what we're giving up, right? So I see the benefits, but I, I also see some, some real challenges here. And um, wait a second. One of the other things I was thinking about with the schedule, with the sixth grade now, and I don't know if this happens at all the middle schools, but there had always been an emphasis of having the um, core courses in the morning and the afternoon periods were used for um, unified arts and, uh, you know, and then they, were, they, they kind of flipped things in the afternoon. Anyway, um, with this schedule, we lose that benefit too for our fifth graders that are transitioning to middle school. So um, I think that's an important consideration. Uh, I was wondering how the gifted program fits into the schedule. Is that something that, I mean, we talked about, or you talked about um, the music instruction, but for the gifted services, is that something that would fit in specifically into the win period versus being taken out of Yes, okay. Yeah, so any, any of those, uh, those additional uh, related services that are required to support students, whether they be for students who are gifted or some of our students with IEPs that need related services, those are opportunities, additional opportunities for those services to be provided. Additionally, uh, the win period is not just about intervention, it's also about extension and diving deeper into some of the, the the topics that they may have ex uh, actually explored as a whole class. So it gives an opportunity for those students that are not being pulled out or not being pulled into a small group within the classroom to go deeper into some of those topics within the classroom with that classroom teacher who is the content expert. So although they're not covering new material, they are able to go and, and like I said, go deeper into some of the existing topics that they are covering with the entire class. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, one, other, one other issue I was sort of thinking about, and, and I have a couple other questions that I can send later, but I'm, I'm thinking a lot about what um, the staff concerns for this might be because um, the previous schedule was, was not well received by the staff, it was my understanding. So um, could you just share some of the feedback or, or even if you haven't had, I don't know if you've had a chance to share it with all the staff or this is the first time, so we don't know. Um, that would be important information I would wanna hear. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll be collecting um, more feedback as we go along, but the feedback that uh, I responded to in, in my portion of the presentation was around planning and keeping classes close um, on the same uh, material. So as they go from day to day, uh, it's, pr it's relatively consistent. So that would be interrupted by a win period because then your classes may not be at the same point. Um, like I said before, high school teachers do have a little bit more experience with that because you have different classes, whereas middle school teachers, for the most part, we have some that teach cross grade level, but for the most part, when you teach uh, middle school, you have five of the same classes. 
And with the, our current schedule, you can keep them consistent. So you're, you're going to give a test on Thursday. Everybody's going to get that test on Thursday. With the win period, that may interrupt that a little bit. So it would take some additional planning. So that has come up as a concern. Okay. Thanks so much. I guess my other questions I'll just forward um, at another time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guernsey. Um, Ms. Massa Canelli? Yes, thank you for this. Um, and uh, really kudos for really taking a step back from that last one and coming at this brand new. Um, obviously, there's a lot in here that I very much like. Um, one thing straight off is that I, I hope we can just stop calling it block because that, that it, anyone just hearing the title is going to think we're oh, just trying to revamp what we had before. So I'm not saying I have an idea for what you can call it, but I would suggest not calling it the block anymore. Um, I was wondering if based on this is not, you know, 40. Okay, it's just a point. Um, based on, you know, our current implementation guide for curriculum is 45 minutes. The high school has the model of the, you know, the double block. So I was wondering if how 67 minutes is perceived by staff as impacting the curriculum delivery. So we've, ha we've had some initial conversations with some of our curriculum leaders in terms of some of the work that they're doing now with teachers that would lend itself to being delivered in a 67 minute block. I think it's really about looking at planning over the course of seven days as opposed to one day at a time and really looking at breaking up the curriculum or the units that will be taught over that seven day period um, and, and identifying how the win period figures into that overall planning time. So it's, it's I think it's an adjustment, a, definitely a big adjustment in terms of the type of planning that will be involved, but I think that the curriculum as it stands will not require, a, it won't require a complete overhaul of the curriculum, but there is some work that will need to be done in terms of looking at um, how teachers might need to modify some of the implementation guides in order to actually fit, like I said, that planning over the course of a seven day period. Okay, thank you. Um, and really, it's planning over five days, because every seven days represents five meetings with those students. Um, and I do share Mrs. Guernsey, you know, again, the, the staff has asked that the current model isn't working, and we can't expect different results if we don't try this. And I see the benefits of all this. But I also agree that I, I think it's misleading to include the win period in that those instructional calculations. When we've turned right around and say explicitly, curriculum is not going to be advanced during that time. Um, and I think that is how we are understanding the phrase instructional time. Um, and again, I, I'm accepting that, you know, 302 minutes, as opposed to, I think it's the 322, it's actually less instructional time, but that by how it is being structured, we believe it's going to be better instruction. And so that the, you know, the contention is, is that is a worthwhile trade-off. Um, and, but again, I, I do agree that I, I think it's, um, I, I, misleading is the wrong word because that's, that sounds negative. I just I don't think it's appropriate to do that. I do hope um, I echo Mrs. Gerber's concern about the music pullout, and I would love to see it at least a, another look at what if it were instead of three times a cycle, which I believe is what it is would be right now. What if it were only one time or two times, and using the win block to win period to supplement that? Um, you know I. Again, I haven't done the math in terms of how many times would you have to use wind blocks in order to achieve what is achieved in that music block. So I understand maybe it wouldn't be enough, but I would like to think we could reduce it from three. Um, because again, that, that's something loud and clear parents have really begged for and said, my student didn't pursue music because of this. Um, and that to me is just such a shame. Um, Mrs. Canale, I, Mrs. Yeah. just to interrupt for one second, I think Mr. Cummings had something that he, that's okay. No, that, that's okay, and I, I appreciate the, I just want to go back to this, circle back to this issue of instructional minutes, and I appreciate, Ms. Mexicali, what you, how you attempted to redefine it. I think my caution is, and, and perhaps we do need a different term for that, um, but I think that anything, instructional minutes, or whatever term we use, right, the time we spend on instruction um, should be uh, determined by what students need not necessarily whether it's new learning or old learning. So if a student needs entrenchment, if a student needs intervention, if a student needs extension, all those things really do count as time spent on what a student needs. And um, I think it's a, um, I certainly recognize the need that's been expressed that we have to, we can do um, better um, at defining what the um, 
enrichment is, the extension is that students get. But that's for those students, those minutes are as valid as a student who needs the additional reading support or goes off to music or whatever they do during that period of time. Um, we don't, this isn't an issue that, let me put it this way, we, we accept that differential at the elementary level, we should accept it at the other levels as well. That, that's the point I, I wanna make about whatever we wanna call instructional minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I, I like one way I would differentiate, you know, classroom time versus instructional time would be two ways you know, two different ways to reference it. Um, I do also have one other concern for the student who isn't getting pulled out for an enrichment, who isn't being pulled out for an in intervention, and the challenge of avoiding that becoming a study hall. Um, because, you know, I did see one of the suggestions there being, you know, working on a long-term assignment, which is homework. Um, and that if it's supposed to be something that is fun and interesting, you know, especially by the time to you, you get to your eighth graders, the question will be, well, am I accountable for this? Because if I'm not accountable for this, I'm not doing it and not engaging in it. So I, I'm not saying that with an answer in mind. I'm saying that that is something I would anticipate you're hearing, um, which brings me to my uh, last question. And then I had a comment, um, which is what, when will there be an opportunity for this to be presented to parents? Obviously, it'd be wonderful if our entire middle school community were watching this meeting and then could send feedback. But obviously, that's not happening. Um, but... I do think that those other ones were enormously appreciated by parents who had tremendous concerns and actually and, and ended up raising a lot of really valuable points. Um, so I just, that's one thing that I didn't see on the timeline. Is, is any parent out, re yeah, was it on there and I missed it's it? In, it's in there, it's in the January part of the. Okay, I apologize, I missed that. So it says, conduct PD, communicate plan to students and families through info sessions. My fault, so thank you. Uh, I think it'll be valid. And, and last, and this is just a comment I wanna say as a teacher who walks in, uh, who works in an eight drop two and who, you know, this is a, a second language to me so I'm very comfortable with it, that I am sure you're going to hear the comment, this is too confusing for our students. And I can only say emphatically, no it is not. They're going to get used to walking around with a schedule, consulting it for their next block, um, and I don't know what I or, you know, other teachers can do to help communicate that, but I would just say, you know, really emphatically to parents, they adjust beautifully, the variety is nice, um, the taking a break from a class is very much valued, which we very much saw with the high school, um, but it's not too confusing to follow. And I know the middle schools, you're already aware of the importance of routine, and I'm sure that that's going to be, you know, really brought home to them. So uh, thank you so much for all of this work. Ms. Kelly. I know it's late and I'm gonna be super quick, but I just couldn't waste the opportunity. And I know Meg knows exactly what's coming, but because <laughs> we've talked about it ad nauseum, so I just have to say it. To the point that um, uh, Mr. Cummings made about elementary schools effectively doing the block scheduling, uh, my only counter to that, and I have to say it, is that those kids still get recess. They still get a break, they still get recess. We're taking away two transitions from them. Those are movement breaks. I know it eats into, you know, taking attendance and all that stuff takes away from instructional time. But just looking at, I just think it would be such a wasted opportunity since we're doing all this work and revamping the schedule. I know I'm not asking to add minutes in, but if there's any way we can incorporate some sort of recess, outdoor time, I know that comes with more logistics and funding, but that is something I would desperately, desperately support. And I feel like, again, these fifth graders, I, I, you know, like Jessica was saying, sixth graders, the gap between sixth and eighth grade, these fifth graders, when they were in elementary school, two months before starting middle school, were enjoying, you know, bonus birthday recesses. And two months later, just because they switched buildings, now we're going to ask them to sit through no recess and a 67 minute period. And I I struggle with that, and I, I think you know eighth graders may struggle with it too, but especially those sixth graders. And I just couldn't waste the opportunity to make another recess plug. Sorry. Thank you, Miss Kelly. I want bonus recess, bonus birthday recess. I mean, that I could. could we have that during. It sounds we could use that during these meetings. I think every once in a while. Um, any other questions? Okay, seeing none. I'm. Expect you are going to be getting some follow-up questions on this. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, 
exciting to hear the feedback that you get from the parent and teacher community. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we're moving on. Approval of African American, Black, Latino, and Puerto Rican Studies course that the Board of Education approved the African American, Black, Latino, and Puerto Rican Studies course. Kind of a motion, Mrs. Gerber. Kind of a second, Mrs. Guernsey. Um, we've had a lot of discussion about this um, course, Mr. Cummings. I don't know if you have anything um, new to share, or if you want to make any comments. Um, no, I don't have really anything new to share. I, I just, I just want to thank um, the, everybody who's been involved in this process. I know that uh, I think I, I can speak for um, the staff, um, all of the staff, when I when I say how um, really uh, proud we can be of our students and the um, the depth of feeling and um, thinking they've brought to this. Um, no matter where people land on either side of this, uh, the the capturing uh, and hearing of student voices is, uh, to my mind, uh, one of the most important things we bring forward from from this conversation. I, I um, you know, whether it, whatever whether it's been at the public meetings or in the letters that you've sent or in the editorials that have been in the student newspapers, it, it's just really powerful that to hear you and um, so I, I just want to thank you for that and I want to thank the uh, the parents um, and the staff who've committed to this again no matter where people land on this the the um, the commitment that people have brought to it the thinking that people have brought to it um, has has really been f from my perspective inspiring to the work that we do and it um, the ability to shift um, from uh, something that has driven us for the past nearly two years in the pandemic response to something that, um, and I'm not dismissing the meaning of all that and the importance of all that by any means, but our, um, that this has engaged our community in a conversation about really deep thinking on learning and um, race and what this district stands for and what this district wants to promote um, has been powerful. Uh, and I, I think a much needed um, shift in emphasis for the work ahead. And I, I wanna thank the board, um, the members of the board for, for their consideration, the, the, the time they've taken as well to um, engage with the public on this, to engage with our staff on this, um, to really delve into the work that's required in, in making a thoughtful decision. So um, I, I just, I think this is, um, I'm just really, I, I think, proud of everybody for the work that's happened around this. It's, it's, it's been incredibly important. And no matter where this lands tonight, I think the conversations that this has initiated and begun will be very important for the work going ahead. And just, um not to recap everything, but this is a course that we are required by state statute to offer. Um, as it was presented to the board, it did take on somewhat a dual component about offering the course um, per the state statute and also having fulfilled the one credit in US history. And I'm not gonna go through that because we've had a lot of discussion on that. So it was a two prong um, just in the way that we put it forward. But the parameters set by the state were, um, you know, CERC did do the work on the curriculum. We are required to adhere to that document. Um, so that was the starting point. And with that, I will give it to the board for, um, for any discussion. Ms. Jacobson, thank, who was not present for the last, we missed you at the last meeting, but um, Sorry, the floor I is yours. I had a banquet. <laughs> um, just a point of clarification before I move forward is, that just to be clear, the piece on the graduation requirement is not a voting item before this body. That is not contained in the document before us. So I just wanted to clarify that point to the public. And I understand a lot of people wrote a lot of emails, and I'm not sure who shared that with them, but that's not contained in the document before us. 
So it's not a, actually a voting item of this body. I think that you're correct in the, the CERT document. It is not contained in that document, but in putting it forward that um, the intent was as it's moved forward to the public that it was going to fulfill the one credit in U.S. history as presented. But as terms of it could the be the document that we're the, voting on is not, it's not that in that is, document. That, does not, that language is not contained okay. in the document. Right, which is what we're voting on. Okay, thank you. Um, before moving, I don't know. The floor is yours right now. Okay. Um, I have a proposed amendment to the motion that I will pass out to the board, if that's okay. Or do you have them at your desk? I'll just give everyone a second to read it. Or would you want me to read it, Mrs. Vitale? Why don't you read it for the public? Just Okay, sure. Making a motion to amend the motion on the table. That would read that pursuant... Oop, sorry, need glasses. <laughs> that pursuant to Connecticut Public Act 19-12, the Board of Education approved the African-American, Black, and Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Humanities course as developed by the State Education Resource Center, CERC, and received by the State Board of Education, inclusive of the title, course description, scope, sequence, and objectives, including CERC's recommended prerequisites of U.S. history and modern world history. And if someone wants to second that, then I can go into explanation of the motion. Ms. Rotelli? So this really just does two simple things. It removes the requirement that Global 9 and Global 10 be successfully completed in order to take this class. So there would be no required rec prerequisites for this course and simply puts in the recommendations that CERC put forth of U.S. history and modern world history. It pretty much is just clean copy of what was approved or developed by CERC and approved, well, I guess, received by the State Board of Education um, and when they took up this matter on December 2nd, 2020. So that's all that it does, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Ms. Guernsey. I'm sorry, I just want to go back to the um, notion that we weren't uh, voting on an aspect of this being U.S. history because that uh, requirement, because that was how it was presented to us. So I'm confused about where that's missing from our approval today. I don't understand that. It is not in the document itself, but it is in approving it. That was part of our approval process. The assumption that if this moved forward, that it would be counting as one credit in U.S. history. So is that still the assumption then? when we're voting on it now? I'm, I just want to make sure I know what I'm voting on. The assumption right now is that if um, staff presentation, that as presented, the document, if approved, would be considered um, meeting one credit in U.S. history. That's correct. Thank we, you. We brought it forward with that expectation. I understand that was the expectation, Mr. Cummings, but what we are voting on is a document that does not contain that language. Someone can make a motion to amend the document if they want to or something like that, but what we are voting on is the curriculum document that is, that is not contained in there. So let's not make it any more complicated. That may be the administration. I'm not making it more complicated. I'm, I'm speaking to what I was, I was asked a question and I answered the question. But that's not in the document that we were sent. I'm not arguing that point. We, I'm making okay. a comment based on the question I was asked. Okay, so what we are voting on is the document. We are, we are voting on the document and approving the course as presented. So as part of that presentation process. No, we're not. We're voting on it as approved by the state. We have a motion, we have a motion right. on the table right okay. now. Okay. That's, so it's been seconded and that's the motion. Go ahead. Mr. Asa. So I guess just to be clear, and I guess um, I would address this through the chair to the superintendent, um, the way I'm reading this motion, um, to me it makes it explicitly clear 
but the course fulfills a graduation requirement exclusively as a humanities course or as an elective. Would that be correct? Based on, on the motion in front of us? Yes. The amendment or the one on the? The, the amendment okay. that's proposed on the table. I believe that's what Ms. Jacobson um, stated, yes. Okay, so basically making it exactly what it is, the CERC document, and taking out what was presumably proposed as a U.S. history fulfillment. Correct. Okay, thank you. Follow up? Ms. Jacobson. All social studies classes are humanities classes, so it would fulfill either social studies or an elective. Either way, that, that student may choose to utilize it. Oh, Sorry, just thank, to clarify. I didn't want you to make it. No, that, that actually clarifies it, because I, I just wanted to be sure. Um, I do have a couple comments on this, if anyone else has anything on that first, though. Mr. Tell, you seconded. I don't know if you have a comment. Uh, Ms. Ms. Grinsley, I'm sorry, the floor is still yours if you have. You know, I'm not even sure how really to respond or when to respond because this was not my understanding of what we were voting on and now I have a motion in front of me that I'm trying to process. So um, I just want to share um, with this board and with the public that's watching that um, I really felt like this course was an opportunity for us to be leaders, um, you know, leaders, um, in, in, in terms of the responsive needs that we had to this community. Um, you know, we've been receiving a lot of um, emails from the community. It's very apparent that um, we have a, a population that's um, really being um, harmed even by the discussions that we're having. Um, so when we add in sort of this new twist about uh, confusion about what we're voting on, that's that's really difficult for me and I probably for the public. Um, and I just think that, um, you know, this was an opportunity for sh to show the, the public that we really value multiple perspectives and um, that we hear you and we validate you. And I think a lot of that's getting lost in this discussion. And I would add to that a second point, and that is um, the harm that it will cause if we um, pass a motion like this that takes away the US history element. I think it's extremely harmful um, based on the conversations we've had. And um, I, I think that it actually sends, sends um, even though it may not be the intention of this board, it would send the message that in fact we, we don't value your perspective and um, that we don't validate you. And um, that, that really um, is difficult for me to swallow. Um, frankly, I would um, be deeply disgusted if we sent that message to our community. And um, I'm just really um, kind of angry about how this is going about now as a board vote. So I'm sharing that with the board. Thank you. And Ms. Guernsey, I want to be clear that the approval of the African American, Black, Latino, and Puerto Rican Studies course, the motion that's before the board, is as it was presented to us. It was presented to us as the CERC document. And if that CERC document was approved by the board, the intent of the administration was to offer it as the one credit in US history. That is what is the motion that is on the agenda. So as putting it forward, it was a dual part process. Um, for clarification, but we could have voted on two separate items, as Ms. Jacobs has said. Um, you know, amendments can be made. This, the curriculum document itself um, is the CERT document. Moving it forward, that is how it would be um, delivered if approved as presented, it would be considered one credit in US history. Thank you for that clarification again, appreciated. As the motion is written on the agenda. Mr. Asa. So while I appreciate and respect Ms. Guernsey's comments, um, I, I will agree that it is loud and clear um, that there is a lot of work to do to address many voices, not just those listed in this course title. Um, there's a lot of groups that are left out of that as well. Um, we clearly need to dive deep into a lot of our curriculum to make sure that these voices are heard and these perspectives are heard, and that is going to take time. But I would say 
that it's apparent that from my observations of all of the board members that there's never been a time that this board hasn't supported the premise of this course, the course content, it's been said over and over again. Um, I, I do want to just take a moment, and, and I don't want anyone to confuse this because I do support the content of this course. But what I do have a problem with is when the state of Connecticut decides to do this work for us. And I have a problem when the state creates a curriculum and then mandates that every district implement it as designed by them with guidelines and very little leeway to be able to comply with exactly what they said and maybe what more we want in it. And to me, this is government overreach at its worst with regards to education. I do not think, I'm going to support this course because I believe in the content. But my fear is where does it go from here? When does it get to another course that they decide to design and tell us we have to implement without our ability to influence it more? Because I do believe, as I said, we need to do work in this area. But I don't think the state of Connecticut designing our curriculum versus at the local level is the answer. In this course created by CERC, there were many people involved, stakeholders with backgrounds of various demographics and expertises. Our committee within the district worked on this diligently but this course is now in the pilot stage in 30 districts. And what is the feedback that CERC is getting? The feedback that I hear they're getting is that there is no way to complete what is in this curriculum, all of the units, everything, in the time allotted. So what does that mean to me? That makes me automatically think that CERC is going to have to work to modify this curriculum, which we are mandated to, uh, to adhere to. So when they make these modifications, it's gonna get passed down to the districts and they're gonna have to do certain things. What are they gonna strip out of here that's in there that should be taught? Because it can't be. Now I understand that different districts and different children learn differently, but again, this goes to the point that we are being required to administer a course that we do not have enough control over. I want this work to be at the local level. I will support more work throughout our entire curriculum. But I will support this amendment as presented. And I don't believe that that sends a bad message. We are approving this course because we believe in the content. We believe in the perspectives. And I think this can be a springboard. I really wish that it was us creating the course, the content, and everything around it so we could customize it to our students and our district because that needs to be done. And I, again, I will support that throughout different areas of study. To Mr. Cummings' point, I also appreciate the student voice, and I agree that it's very good input and leads to a desire to look, as I said, at the curriculum as a whole. We need to work with all groups, starting with the ones listed in the title of this course, but there are many more. There's Asian Americans. There's indigenous people. There's other rights. And I'm not saying that approving this course means we're not gonna do that for them because I do, I do approve of the content of this course. So please don't take my vote on this as that I don't believe that perspectives are, are earned or deserved or heard. I think they absolutely are. And if this course is approved as I expect it will be, that is the message that I take away. 
Thank you, Mr. Asa. Before um, we continue the discussion, can I have a motion to extend the meeting to midnight? Ms. Jacobson, can I have a second? Ms. Rotelli, all in favor? Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Vitale, Mr. Asa, Ms. Max Kennelly, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly. Um, motion carries. Oh, all opposed? Sorry. Mrs. Gerber? Motion carries 8 1. Okay. Um, back to the board. Any other comments on the amendment? Ms. Guernsey. I just wanted to relay again that I will not be supporting this amendment. Um, for the reasons that I've described in this meeting and in previous meetings. Thank you, Ms. Grenzi. I, um, I will not be supporting this amendment. While I understand um, Mr. Ace's concerns about um, you know, this course in large part being dictated by the state, um, I would have liked us to have a bigger voice in it also, but I do believe in it, and I do, as I've mentioned many times before, um, agree with the way it was put forward as a course, um, which would both fulfill the state requirement and count as one credit in U.S. history. No other comments from the board? We'll take it to the public. Oh, sorry, Ms. Skarber. Um, yeah, I won't be supporting this amendment either. Um, <laughs> I, um, I think that this, this course, as it was presented to us, by our staff and supported by our staff and administration, um, including the U.S. history fulfillment, I, I think was very important and, and meaningful. And I'm, I just feel that to try to edge it out on a technicality, I find troubling. Um, and I think that it was very clear that we had a lot of support from many uh, staff, many teachers, uh, including history teachers. And we had the support of a former history teacher who's sitting at this table with us right now. And I just feel that this amendment is just circumventing all of that um, on a technicality. And I don't support that. Um, any other comments? We'll take it to the public. This is on the amendment only. If anybody would like to give comment, I invite you to come, over, come forward. Um, if you've already spoken to this issue, um, our policy is that you cannot speak to a, a subject twice. Okay, seeing um, no comment, we'll take it to the board for a vote. This is voting on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment? Please raise your hand. Mr. Telly, Ms. Jacobson, Mr. Asa, Mrs. Maxa-Canelli, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly, all opposed? Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Gerber, Mrs. Vitale, we're back to the main motion as amendment, amended. Get some water. Um, any other comments? Ms. Jacobson? Um, now that we're back on the main motion, I think that most people in the public know that all nine of us take this job really seriously and spend a lot of time, and that no decisions that we make are made easily. But I'm going to echo a point on Mr. Asa's. This motion is not only momentous in its content, but it is also momentous in the fact that it is the first time that in our state's history, the state took it upon themselves to mandate an entire curriculum document. That is not a small thing to vote on tonight. It is a precedent. We already know K-8 is in the works. We already know K-12 is in the works. We already know an approved reading program list has already passed. And some of these things may be optional, but it doesn't take much to make them into a mandate as well. There is already existing statute on the duties of boards of education that include the development and approval of curriculum. When a legislature creates conflicting statute, it creates problems, and that's what they did, period. Curriculum development and approval is a duty of the board, local board of education, not the state of Connecticut, so I want to just let the public know that this is a precedent-setting vote, and just because we may love it does not 
diminish the magnitude of that because there may come a day when you don't love it. So this is an incredibly difficult thing that is totally separate from the content of this course, but on the precedent of an overreaching General Assembly. And I hope that they hear us and may other boards follow suit to say, standards are one thing, materials are one thing, requiring course topics is one thing, even requiring a course is something, but a 300 page curriculum document with no leeway under threat of audit is another. I'm gonna approve it, but I reserve the right in the future to you know, not have this be a precedent setting motion and that we as a board will decide what's best on the local level. Thank you. Any other comments on the motion as amended? Ms. Guernsey? I would just add that we as a board um, have an opportunity to decide what we're doing with this course right here, right now, even though it was passed this way to the state. That is my opinion. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really sorry to see it's going this way. Thank you, Ms. Guernsey. Um, I will be supporting this motion as amended because I think it's very important that we move this, this course work forward. I am, I'm not happy that it is not being recognized for what I believe it is, a course in American history, um, an added perspective. I hear the concerns about perspectives missing, but I don't think that that's a reason not to try to move forward where we can. Um, but I, um, I respect the, you know, that this, there's differing opinions on this. Um, and it's our job to vote. I'll take it to minutes late. We have other stuff to deal with. Um, so I will not belabor this right now, but um, I will be voting in favor as amended, but with reservations, wishing that it went a, another way as well. With that, I will um, bring it to the public for public comment. I'm sorry, Mrs. Maxson Canelli. I appreciate uh, the comments, but I do want to come back to Mrs. Jacobson's point because I think it's vitally important that this is something that stays with the public. Um, you know, it's, we live in a, a state where fortunately I think many of us are very amenable to the suggestions that come down from the state. But just say this, the mood in the state changes. And I want to give the example in Oklahoma. Okay, so I'm reading this so that I get it right. You know, 100 years after the Tulsa massacre, something which unfortunately I had to learn about by watching an HBO movie and I thought I was seeing a work of fiction and I was so horrified only to discover it was true. So I take that you know, as an important point. But 100 years after the Tulsa massacre, almost to the day, the Oklahoma legislature, the state taking away any discretion of local districts passed its memory law Oklahoma and educational institutions are now forbidden to follow practices in which any individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on any issue related to race. They took the decision out of the hands of local districts. They mandated that, allowing no discretion. So, you know, again, the idea, and Mrs. Jacobson had used the example with, you know, I've heard this before, the idea that banning a book in Texas is the same thing as mandating a book in Connecticut. You're taking the decision away from local districts. And I did have, the more I thought about it, and especially as policy chair, where we work painstakingly in that room at those meetings, reviewing all of our policies, and to just have that be utterly circumvented, and I'm gonna use Mr. Ace's expression, by the governmental overreach in Hartford in this state um, is appalling and they need to get out of that business, and they need to let local districts do their work. Thank you, Mrs. Max and Canelli. Um, I'm fading fast, it's tired. Um, to, the, to the public, any public comment on this? The motion as amended. And again, if you remind me, you don't need to give your address for the record. Uh, hi, I'm JD Fitzpatrick. Um, I've been to these meetings for the past while specifically to talk about this course. The biggest issue I have with this argument about government overreach is look at everyone at this table. How many of you are someone that isn't white? 
None. None of you are not white. And as a result, none of you without this state's overreach would have proposed this course or even thought about getting it into these schools. Now, you may be shaking your heads and thinking that, but when did this course come into your mind? It came into your mind when Ned Lamont signed it into state law. There is no other possibility that this course would have existed if Ned Lamont never wrote it into law. No other district had, had, has gotten it into their schools until Ned Lamont wrote it and sent it to the state. It is very irresponsible of you board members to accuse government overreach from a state that is purposely trying to make a voice heard and make it so people can have the option to make the voice heard and not lose out on other courses. I know you have your worries about not making an American history class, and I know it's past the point of return, but that thing you just did, that amendment, just completely made it so those voices are seen as lesser than once again by making it an elective and not giving it the same credits as the other American history courses. There is no other option now. And you have just shown that Fairfield believes that African American and Latino voices are lesser than the current American history voices. Thank you. Any other members of the public like to give comment? Take it back to the board. Mr. Asa? While I know we don't usually go back and forth with the public, I do feel a need to address that comment. And while I respect your feelings, I respectfully disagree. I believe that we have a superintendent that is determined for this district, supported by his board, who approved hiring a director in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I believe that was the first step that this board took towards working towards items and classes like this, incorporating voices in different classes. I personally believe that we started that path. Is it a couple years later than when the development of this course came? Yes, but not for a second do I believe you that this district is not committed, especially now moving forward from a few weeks ago and on with the addition of this executive director. I feel that we are starting on the right path. Mrs. Gerber. I would just also say that um, our superintendent also recommended that this course be accepted as a U.S. history um, fulfillment. And, and that was not listened to by the majority of this board. So while I agree that it's really good that we have done other things to address issues of diversity, and equity, um, I do think that this curriculum, uh, accepting this curriculum as it was recommended by our superintendent, by our staff, uh, would have also sent an additional uh, message as to what we support. Any other comments? Okay, let's um, take it to the board for a vote. The main, uh, all those approve. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm missing the amendment. That pursuant to Connecticut Public Act 1912, that the Board of Education approved the African American, Black, and Puerto Rican Latino Studies Humanities course as developed by the State Education Resource Center, CERC, and received by the State Board of Education, inclusive of the title, course description, scope, sequence, and objectives, including CERC's recommended, recommended prerequisites of US history and modern world history. Um, all in favor? Ms. Rotelli, Ms. Jacobson, Mrs. Vitale, Mr. Asa, Ms. Maxa Canelli, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly, um, Ms. Guernsey, all opposed? Mrs. Gerber. The, uh,
Moving on, approval of accounting two and business of travel courses at the Board of Education approve accounting two and business of travel courses. Mrs. Jacobson, can I have a second? Mr. Peterson. Any additional questions on this course? Mr. P Mr. Asa? Um, just to confirm and refresh um, to the superintendent, um, there is no FTE impact on any of this, correct? Uh, we do not expect any. We think that, again, similar to the question around math, that there should be a redistribution of, of uh, FTE um, from other existing courses. Any other questions? Seeing none, take it to the public. Any members of the public like to give comment on this? Seeing none, take it to the board for a vote. The, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Asa. Sorry, one more question. And, and could you just refresh my memory as far as, um, I'm, I'm hoping that there's good interest in this course, but we do have a criteria, right, for a minimum enrollment? We do. Um, I would say it's a flexible criteria, um, but one of the decisions that we go over when we um, work with the principals um, on uh, final course selection and final decisions around FTE is that is that minimum. The only flexibility we might impose is when a course is new, um, we may allow it to build an audience by uh, running it um, with a smaller uh, enrollment than we normally would accept, um, but that doesn't come with the additional FTE, so choices have to be made. Thank you. Ms. Maxwell-Canelli. And I apologize, and due to my um, letting the ball drop, I'm not going to hold up any vote on this. However, after the last meeting, I'd had a number of questions regarding the process with accounting two specifically, and I don't believe I ever got answers to any of those questions. Um, again, it, I, I dropped the ball and not then following up before right now when it's time to vote, so I'm not going to allow this to hold it up, but I don't know if I, the, the, the point being we already have an existing course, so why aren't we actually looking at a curriculum document on that? Um, we did We did look into that. One of the questions you had asked, and I apologize, I'm working on memory here, uh, one of them was that you recall that an art class had been divided, uh, right, maybe that's not the right word. That It had been class, reduced from a full year yeah, to, a, to a semester. That's right, and, and we looked back at that uh, between Dr. Savagenzik and I, we couldn't find that, why that was, was different than this one. I think essentially we brought it forward after going to the discussion when Mr. Willinger talked about um, altering the, shortening the course from, from a full year to a semester, and then there was enough curricular changes within the course that we saw that we thought that really constituted a new course. It, it, was, a, it was a judgment decision at the time. Um, we may not do it again the next time, you know, based on our, our relative experience now. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, to the board for a vote. That the Board of Education approve accounting to and business of travel courses. All in favor? Motion carries 9-0. Approval of the 2022-2023 Fairfield Public Schools calendar that the Board of Education approved the 2022-2023 FPS calendar. Can I have a motion? Mr. Asa, second. Mr. Peterson. Um, just since our last reading of this, the calendar was updated just to, to move April break to um, align with CES. The superintendent um, verified when Bridgeport was likely to take its break, and ba based on the sense of the body we took at our last meeting, we wanted our break to align with Bridgeport's just for the benefit of our aquaculture students. So that, that, has already been, that change has already been um, addressed in the calendar in front of you. And with that, I take it to the board for any discussion. Mr. Asa. So I apologize. I, I have a um, motion that I'm to amend the calendar regarding the February break that I discussed. Um, do all of you have a copy of um, what I had sent? So you can follow along with me if you just take a minute. Um, and I just want to put my motion forward and then I can talk about it. Put your motion forward. Okay. So I have a motion to amend the 2022-2023 proposed calendar to include a February break. Moving the February 16th early dismissal of PK through 12 PD to February 17th, and having no school February 20th through 24th, 
thus extending the last day of school to Thursday, June 15th, 2023. Can I have a second? Mr. Peterson. Mr. Asa, the floor is yours. Okay, so there were some um, questions and good points brought up at the last meeting. Um, I think I had, remind, I had asked for the last 10 years of data um, and with um, some outliers, it was somewhere around 4.2, Ms. Max and Canelli, that, yeah, please pass that down, sorry, it was a bad toss. Um, roughly 4.2 average days um, per year, including the outliers. Um, Mr. Cummings brought up a good point about what happens when Christmas is on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Um, so I asked uh, Mr. Cummings to look into the next um, iterations three or four years down the road to see how it would play out. Um, looking to the future with Christmas on a Wednesday or a Thursday in 24 and 25 respectively, using the same 187 days for staff and 182 days for students, with the assumption that the same amount of professional development will occur, taking into consideration which days the Jewish holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur fall on the calendar and if it affects days off, uh, and with school, the assumption that school begins on the Monday before Labor Day. The administration has projected that the last day of school is follows. In 23-24, it would be the 12th of June. 24-25, would be the 13th of June, and 25-26 would be the 12th of June. Um, assumption is that the above dates would be pushed out at least a day or two, probably because of snow, before um, taking away from April break, based on the number of days we allocate. So based on the above, I believe that a federal, February break is sustainable, and for the health, mental health, and well-being of our students and our staff, I hope that you'll support this amendment. Any discussion? Just so you know, uh, what's been passed out here is, is what I iterated, and, and also um, I believe uh, Dr. Parrish um, prepared a draft of the calendar of how it would look next year with February break. Mrs. Gerber? Uh, just uh, through the chair to, to uh, Superintendent. Um, do we know, is, is Juneteenth going to, would that be a holiday? Um, we've not had any um, confirmation of that from the state at this point. Okay, because I just noticed it would, you know, if we have one snow day, or two snow days, I should say, we'd be pumped into that next week, and I didn't know if the 19th would be a school a day off or not. So, just curious about that. We're waiting for um, how it's going to be, if it's going to be addressed, say, for like a Columbus Day, or would it be addressed, say, like President's, or Washington's birthday? Got it, thanks. I know better. I should never, should never even come out of my mouth. Ms. Jacobson, I'm sorry. Um, just, just similar as going in, um, to Mrs. Gerber's point, going into that next week, I just, um, is there a consideration on where would we pull from February 1st or April and just the continuance of that conversation because going into the third week of June, not only for the heat purposes, but I remember a couple years ago when we were going to look at going into that week and a lot of seniors were going to have to miss their graduation because that is the week that college orientations commence. So we, I don't think we can actually go into that week of the 19th. So. I don't know if Mr. Asa has an idea on if we do have snow days. Well, I guess it depends on when they fall, to Mr. Cummings' point. If they're before February, we could pull from February. But if they're after February, we would have to pull from April. Is that my, a correct understanding, Mr. Asa? Just to answer that, so um, my intention, based on feedback from the last meeting, um, and my hope was that in the bottom of this um, calendar, we talk about the first six snow days extending the length of the school year. Um, I think this can be done on an annual basis. It doesn't really have to do with, with my motion, but um, my suggestion would be that, you know, we either look at that number, but I think the consensus seemed to be that we pull from April, um, and I would support lowering that number from six to a lower number to avoid that.
Any other discussion on this? Ms. Mascanelli. Um, again, I would be um, interested in what Mr. Cummings had to say about this. My hesitation is, is what we know very well about learning is that the quality of the learning in February versus the quality of the learning in June. Um, and again, tremendous efforts by staff. I'm not taking anything away from uh, their organization and what they are attempting to achieve, but there's no comparison. Um, this would be taking away, therefore, three more days for AP classes that have set curriculum to cover before exams. And that, I, I appreciate the notion of this. Um, that is my big concern, um, is the quality of the instruction. And, and if we were to, you know, to approve this, and I would really want that uh, early dismissal day on Friday moved to Tuesday so that we take proper advantage of the PD time and not use, the, that day is just gonna become permission to leave Thursday night for vacation, and therefore losing essentially another day of classes. Um, and so I'd have a problem with the Friday PD, but the bigger concern really is the quality of the instruction then. That, that's my hesitation. And um, seeing no other comments, I share that concern and just having memories of when past boards remove the February break. There was a concern about losing April break, but there was also um, value in having that time for students to be in school in, in advance of various testing and just p students being engaged. I also seem to recall that there was just concerns from working parents that it, it really, it was childcare challenges around having that break in February. So I, um, I also have concerns about going later into June just because of the air conditioning, especially since this iteration of the calendar also has us starting on the Monday before Labor Day instead of the Thursday before Labor Day. So kids are getting a longer time in the buildings while they're warmer on both ends. Um, well, I definitely appreciate Mr. Asa's efforts. Um, I guess I just have memories of losing that April break and you know, this board knows that weather is never on my side. So if I vote in favor of this, you know that there'll be a blizzard and we'll be like losing, losing everything. So uh, with that, any other comments before we take it to the public? Seeing none, any members of the public like to give comment on the amendment? Seeing none, take it to the board. Mr. Smalley, would you like to give? Okay, take it to the board. So you're raising your hand. Um, we are voting on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment? Ms. Rotelli, Mr. Asa, Mr. Peterson, Ms. Kelly. All opposed? Ms. Jacobson, Ms. Guernsey, Mrs. Gerber, Mrs. Vitale, Mrs. Max and Kennelly. Um, the amendment fails. Back to the main motion. Mrs. Max and Kennelly. Um, I wanted to make a motion to move the uh, Friday, September 23rd, early release PD day to Friday, September 2nd. Um, we have this. Um, my motion was to move the Friday, September 23rd, early release day to Friday, September 2nd. Any, Mr. Peterson? Just through the chair to. Oh. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm a second, Mr. Peterson. Just through the through the chair to Ms. Max and Kennelly. Um, wouldn't that? Wouldn't that be in the same vein as your previous objection, putting the Friday right before a long weekend? I would normally agree if it weren't the first week of school. Um, and I just think, I've after I made the comments at the last meeting, um, I got, first of all, I appreciated Mr. Aces um, providing some commentary from elementary school. I've gotten mixed reactions um, on both sides regarding the, because initially what I wanted to do was push the start to Tuesday. But I do think they are exhausted by Friday after five days, and that to make use of that as a half day, I just, and I, I to, to Mr. Peterson's point, I just don't think on the first day of school that that's going to be, a, okay, let's already take a day off to 
again, that's my guess. Um, you could just as easily say where it's currently occupied, that for our um, non-Jewish uh, observant students, that that's likewise a long weekend. So that, that, was, that was the motivation behind there, is just to do something to give a little bit of relief to that first full week. Mr. Issa? Um, through the chair to Mr. Cummings, um, can you just shed some light on whether staff would be ready at that point for whatever PD is, is provided then? Um, thank you. I, I, don't, I don't think that the afternoon of the 2nd, September 2nd, would be as valuable for uh, professional learning time as the afternoon of the 23rd. I think that um, Ms. Mexicanelli raises a good point that it is, it is the first full week of school um, and we recognize that um, not only are students uh, perhaps dragging by the end of the week, but our staff will be as well. And I think that it, it, as a building principal, if I had that time with staff, um, I think that the, the thing I would probably have, I would not be able to engage them in many meaningful learning on the, on the afternoon of the second. Um, I think that we, our staff can accommodate with students in school um, pacing changes and, and things to, uh, to um, help them, support them during that week. Um, I think that um, the staff will be more accessible to new learning on the 23rd, um, and that would be a more valuable time for, for our staff to engage in any professional learning. Any other comments before we vote on the motion? I mean the amendment. Uh, take it to the public before we vote. Bob Smoller, the right button, yeah. Um, I just want to echo what Mr. Cummings said. That first week or two, and I know Ms. Max Canelli knows this, is absolutely chaotic. You're just trying to get to know the kids, trying to get room set up, trying to do everything. So to the degree that it can be left, you know, focused on instructional issues and also just preparatory issues in, in getting the first uh, week or two uh, off the ground would, would be best. I don't think we would be able to get a lot of constructive learning done uh, in a PD session because we have our heads so much in just trying to get the year going. Thank you. Um, any other comments before we vote? Mr. Asa. I would just, not that I would support this, um, but you know, I don't know if in your thinking that maybe an amendment to start on the Tuesday, extending the school year a day, maybe that gives some relief or not. Um, again, I'm not advocating for that, but um, just a thought. Mrs. Maxicanelli? Uh, just briefly, um, I'm happy to withdraw the amendment. Um, I, d I didn't do my due diligence, and, and it was I voiced it at the last meeting. I, again, did not follow up with Mr. Cummings. So, um, and I forget the Roberts Rules process on withdrawing an amendment, but um, I'd be willing to do so. Um, Mr. Peterson, are you... I think you second it, so are you okay with that? Uh, I, I would be okay with that. I'm, I'm not sure that that would be Robert's Rules compliant, but if we all agree on it, then that's fine. I'm so tired right now that Mr. Peterson, it's, it's oh, yeah. Is, is anyone amenable to that? Thank you. Um, back to the main motion. Any comment? Back to the public. Any comment? Seeing none, to the board. All in favor of the, um, education of 2023 Fairfield Public Schools calendar. Motion carries 9-0. Um, I'm sorry, I just wanna make one comment. Just, um, Mr. Cummings, we had a couple of um, questions from parents about just some other holidays that aren't on the calendar. Um, and we just, can you just reiterate that if a student misses school because they are celebrating um, a holiday that is not a day off from school, what the procedure would be? Um, absolutely, thank you. If, if there are students who celebrate holidays that, um, that are not uh, holidays, uh, days off, I should say, on our adopted calendar, uh, we only ask that parents communicate that to the schools. Students should not be marked. Uh, they should certainly be excused absence for those days. Um, and also, 
uh, we want to make clear, and we'll be re reiterating this with our staff, that for people who are celebrating those holidays, for students celebrating those holidays, um, our staff really should not be expecting students to complete homework during that time or make up for that time. And, and it's a it's a um, an observance of their religious traditions. Um, we have we um, pull back on those expectations. So we'll be reiterating that with our staff. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, and I apologize for not bringing it up before we voted. Moving on, um, new business, authorized BOA chair to execute form SCG 042 for RLMS roof replacement project at the Board of Education, chair be authorized to execute form SCG 042 for the RLMS roof replacement project. Mr. Pop, um, the motion, Ms. Jacobson, second by Mr. Peterson. Um, is this just, sign just a signature? Do you have anything else you would like to add? I'd like Mr. Bob George to come up and just talk about the RLMS roof project for a second, or perhaps a few. Good evening. Yes, so the SCG 042 form is what you have before you. It's just it's uh, authorizing you to sign as the chair of the Board of Ed to accept the uh, design aspects done by Silver Petroselli and uh, that they meet the ed spec criteria. Any questions for Mr. Papa George? Any, Mr. Cummings, do you have anything else that you wanted Mr. Papa George to address, Mr. Asa? Can we get a status update on that project? The status update on the Roger Ledlow Middle School roof is that it, the paperwork has been submitted to the state reimbursement office. It's been processed through. It's gone up to the uh, Department of Administrative Services where it has unfortunately stalled at this point. So we are working through to see if we can get it moving again at this point. Can you just describe what our um, state is doing or the state of the state or the state of the person <laughs> so with the the resignation of the uh, person who oversees the filings they have an interim in there and there seems to be a backlog of just projects that have come through that are just kind of moving slowly through the process at this point because of the backlog and with the resignation and not sure what's going on with who's going to be taking over the position so does this potentially mean that we have to forego reimbursement because of a process? Or like, can we stay on track here if this debacle doesn't work itself out? So we are trying to work through the process right now of getting it approved. Uh, the other option we would have would be to put it out to bid without state approval and then go for special legislation down the road and ask for reimbursement. That is not the option we would like to go with. We are trying every effort possible to get it through the state reimbursement before we go out to bid. However, with the holidays, we're, we're optimistic, but... Not. Is this something that our state reps we could advocate to to try and put some pressure on? Absolutely. Okay. So I, I would ask that um, any of us that can um, familiarize ourselves uh, with this process through Mr. Papa George and do what we can to let anyone we can in Hartford know um, that this is very important, not just for our district, but others. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Papa George. And um, we'll move forward with reaching out to our state reps to see if they can move this forward and maybe even our first select woman who um, you know, might have some connections up there still. Um, so we'll take it to the board for a vote. We'll take it to the public. Any members of the public like to speak to this before we vote? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries 9-0. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Papa George. Discussion and possible first read of bylaw changes. Um, given the hour, we really don't have any first read. It was really just a reminder to the board that um, we are still in the process. I know that a number of board members, oh, Ms. Con Ms. Max Canelli has one that she um, is, has been working on and is willing to distribute to everyone for 
Right, but I, I, I would just say I don't want to treat this as a first read and then we vote the next meeting. I'd like to treat the first yes. read as the next meeting, but I'd like to give the content of it out so that everybody has a hard copy. This is regarding what I mentioned at the last uh, meeting regarding a curriculum and instruction committee. Ms. Maxwell, the floor is yours. No, I, I'm, I'm happy to waive the discussion till the next meeting if you're okay with it being on the agenda as a first read at the next meeting. I am, and I don't, well, if it may not be the next meeting, but we may, depending on um, input from other board members for bylaws changes, my thinking that it might be beneficial just to have a special meeting to address bylaws changes, given the way our agendas have been the last few weeks. I know a number of people have been talking about, I know the Finance Committee, we're talking about potentially um, moving forward with a Facilities Committee, so I know some things are in the works. Thank you, Mrs. Maxa-Canelli, for forwarding this, this to us. Um, Mr. Asa? Just a note that um, going into budget season, um, I personally would have no problem um, bringing this up in February if the agenda allowed for it. So I, I just don't want to necessarily push for a special meeting in January for bylaws change unless there's something that urgent. I don't think we have a meeting that first week in, in January, Nick. I think that we could kind of fit it in there. <laughs> we have four meetings <laughs> in January, so. Your call. Um, I will take that under consideration. Moving on, superintendent's report, uh, approval of minutes, sorry. That the Board of Education approve the November 17th, 2021, 6 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. special meeting minutes. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Ms. Guernsey, second. Mr. Peterson, any discussion? All in favor? Motion carries 9-0. Superintendent's report, Mr. Cummings. All right. Um, well, speaking of a crowded January, um, one of the things that uh, follow up to our um, presentation or our conversation with the State Board of Education around the racial imbalance plan earlier this fall, the um, State Board of Education has requested that Fairfield bring back to them in um, May, May, um, an update on our plan and what they're expecting is that we deliver to them at the end of January for consideration at their February meeting a timeline to meet those expectations in that plan. So I've been working on a timeline that um, we expect the board will have to vote on. I'll be bringing that to you in January um, at the January 11th meeting, I believe it is, for a first read um, and then a vote later in the month. So. Um, I just wanted to make the board aware of that, that that is something that we are we're under a state requirement to, to get back to them, or state expectation to get back to them um, with follow-up on that. So, And that timeline um, is essentially how we're going to move forward to address the racial imbalance issues at McKinley Elementary. Any questions on that topic? Mr. Asa? Just to follow up on that, since I was at the last meeting at the state board, um, there there was a um, an expectation and an agreement that in a six month time frame that we go back before them to present what they called a hard timeline with specific dates, and then after that meeting, we received this request to provide it to them in January for the May meeting. Um, so. Uh, just a little context there. Um, all of a sudden, they decided that um, you know the May meeting was fine, but they actually really wanted the information in January, which you can interpret how you want. Okay, um, Ms. Jacobson. So, just as a follow-up to that, how when are we going to have that conversation in January? That's correct. I'm going to bring it to you as a, 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 my expectation would be a first read at the January 11th meeting. Okay. And it's not um, a full rewrite of the, I mean, we do still have our racial imbalance plan as presented, just a timeline in terms of restarting some of those discussions that have been put on hold. Um, we did share 
the conversation that the board had about this. Um, Mr. Reza, I, can, I think, can concur that um, shared the, you know, the board sentiments. Um, and the response was, please give us a timeline on when you plan to move forward um, after not really moving forward during this pandemic. So that is where we are. Um, and as more information becomes available, we can forward it to the board prior to the meeting. Committee liaison reports. Uh, Mr. Peterson. I'll try to be quick. Uh, we had a meeting of the Finance and Budget Committee uh, a couple weeks ago now. Um, we discussed uh, a variety of things. We got an up update on a uh, utility management program that we are we're piloting. It's very exciting. I, I'm looking forward to more numbers on that. Um, also talked with uh, Superintendent Cummings about an inventory control program uh, that he had an idea for, taking inventory of all of the materials in the district and seeing where we can, uh, if, if, how we can better uh, redistribute them. Um, also, we uh, talked with uh, Courtney Laborious about uh, the budget management for FTEs. Uh, uh, we advocated for her giving us more information about any changes that are made in that account uh, more frequently. She was she was amenable to that. Uh, that kind of spun into a, a, a much longer discussion about other budget transfers, and I suspect that we'll continue to have that, those discussions uh, going forward about the disclosure of ongoing uh, budget shifts. Um, from, from her. We also, uh, at uh, our chairs at Christina Vitale's uh, recommendation, discussed a little bit whether our board should take, or whether our committee should take a stab at uh, formally defining structural change. And between the three of us, we kind of decided that at our next meeting, we may want to put together some basic ideas about what that means to us before bringing it back to the board for a fuller discussion. So I will be reaching out to you sometime between now and the end of the year, uh, basically looking for ideas from every board member of where you might want that discussion to go. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, board of Health met last night. The um, numbers are going up, but Ms. Mitchell just you know, across the country and in the state, but Ms. Mitchell reported that um, screen and stay is effective. Um, it is, however, creating a lot more work for our nurses, um, a lot more work. So uh, thank a school nurse uh, twice. Um, and Dr. Hotchkiss was um, Dr. Yoon, his tenure on the the board ended, and Dr. Hotchkiss was elected as the new chair. And that is all I have. Any other, um, Ms. Jacobson? So it's not an update per se, but just a feeler out to the board that the next legislative session will start in February. Um, so obviously interested in hearing any thoughts that you may have as we head into that session, but also discuss with the chair possibly um, what has been done in the past is that the superintendent um, leadership and myself have met with the state delegation prior to a session just to get a feeling from them what may be happening, any feedback that the superintendent or the board may provide to them moving forward. And just want to reiterate that um, that we're considering doing that again. Um, we wanted everyone to be aware of that. And if there's any thoughts on that going forward, to please share them with me or Christine. And go ahead. Ms. Maxcanelli? Just one very brief question, because I can't remember when this happened in the past. Is that just informally we indicate through the, to the chair, or Mrs. Jacobson, our individual thoughts, or is that a board discussion topic on brainstorming on things of mat things that matter to us? We have not, I don't think, done it. Actually, I think we might have done it both ways. We might have had a board discussion, um, but really it's more if you have specific items, you can just send them to... Ms. Jacobson and myself will make a board, a list of them, share them with the board. Just the timing of it may not work with our January meeting, and um, I hear that nobody wants to add a meeting the first week in January. So we can, I think we can handle some of that, just getting, brainstorming, sending the suggestions to Ms. Jacobson. I'll let you keep the list. And um, we'll share the list that we're going to discuss with the state delegation, um, let you know when the meeting is set, and report back at a board meeting how it went. 
Any other comments? Taking open board comment. Seeing none, public comment. I don't mean to keep you here, but um, I wanted to wait to hear the middle school schedule presentation before commenting. Uh, we just heard the teachers about the proposed middle school schedule this week, this past week. And uh, of course, the first thing we did, uh, we, but I should say, we do support the idea of a longer period. And there are a lot of things that are in this schedule that are attractive. But of course, the first thing we did when we saw the schedule is we, saw, we tried to figure out how we would plan for it. And uh, it is an extraordinarily difficult schedule to plan for. Uh, we already do have, a, a, at the middle school level, a quite broad curriculum. So uh, our view is the same as Ms. Guernsey's is that there is a, a reduction in instructional time to advance the curriculum. And so we're, we still don't know how that would be handled because uh, I, don't, I think you'd have to revise the curriculum. Our opinion is you'd have to revise the curriculum if we were to be able to get it in. The other thing is, is because of the wind period, we would have to uh, basically prep at a 34 minute block. Because if you're gonna keep the scope and sequence of the course moving, and because the wind period appears at different times over a seven day period, we, can't, we don't really have the luxury of prepping for a 67 minute block. Uh, if we tried to do that, then we'd be out of sequence when that 34 minute period popped up. And so um, that would be an extremely challenging prep um, uh, challenge, or I should say challenge for teachers. On top of that, um, because the wind period pops up at different periods of time, uh, we would also have the challenge of basically turning five sections of the same course into five separate preps because you wouldn't be on the same sequence on any single uh, period at any single time. So um, our view is um, that if this were the schedule that were to go into place, there would be an awful lot of work to do, and uh, both on the prep side and on the workload side, um, we would want to bargain impact because uh, we believe there would be a very significant impact on our workload. Uh, that said, I'm engaging in conversations now that we've finally seen something uh, with Mr. Cummings and with the middle school folk uh, to try to find something that is workable that would incorporate all the positives of this schedule but also make it reasonable from a prepping and instructional standpoint uh, to develop a decent flow of curriculum for the students um, during the course of the year. Um, so I did, I did want you to know that I have yet to find a teacher teaching an academic uh, area at the middle school level who is in support of this schedule. They feel it would be a nightmare. And, um, you know, we're trying to find alternatives because the existing schedule is not ideal either. And I think we want to find something that does work. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, before we adjourn, I just want to wish everybody a very happy holiday. And um, thank you to our staff, you know, getting to this first, this first half of the year. Didn't get to say it before Thanksgiving, but thankful for all that you do. And um, hope that you have a happy holiday season and get some much needed rest and a chance to recharge. And with that, motion to adjourn. Mr. Peterson, seconded by Mr. Issa. All in favor? Motion carries, we were adjourned.